Hello. Thank you for joining us for Paradise. This this is Mint Potion's tabletop game stream, um, and I'm hosted as as um, from now on always will be um, by my best friend John. Ah, uh, yes indeed. Um, so today we are doing things a little bit differently. Um, before we were always um, playing Warhammer Forty Thousand, uh, which we love. Um, um, it's it's one of my favorite games. It's the game I spent the most time playing. Um, uh, of any game, frankly. Um, and it's by far the my favorite tabletop game, the tabletop game I played the most and all that. But Paradise is something that um, I started. This is this is the show that grew out of Arts and Cracks. Uh, Arts and Cracks was a purely arts and craft show, as the name is clearly a pun about. Um, and I wanted to move past that, uh, or not move past it, but evolve from it. So Paradise is going to be the place to not just play tabletop games, but also to design and prototype and play test tabletop games. You know, this is a production studio, and we make games, um, and that's what John and I are here to do, is to, is to make uh, tabletop games and to share them with you. So today we're playing Deja Vu. Deja Vu is very near and dear to my heart. Um, Deja Vu is one of, the, one of the concepts I came up with when I first started going to school for game development. Um, and I realized really quickly after, after, starting, after starting to just write down some ideas that um, I was really expressing myself. I, I was being really, really expressive. And I was doing it through interaction and through, through game design um, in a lot of different ways, you know, through, through the level design and through, you know, just the real brief, um, backstory and everything like that. You know, people talk about being discri or I'm sorry, self-expressive, uh, when they're making games and people end up just sort of making characters that are very similar to themselves. And I thought I would fall into that. You know, um, when you're going to school for game design, you learn, you know, the two big categories of, of stuff that goes into a game. Um, not, not necessarily when you're making it, but when you are, you know, just, any game are, you know, the formal elements, which is the mechanical stuff, how a game works, and the dramatic elements, which are all the storytelling aspects. And I thought I'd be like most people, and I'd, you know, spend a lot of time writing stories and, and making art and stuff. And r really quickly, I wound up feeling at home in the formal elements, it actually, you know, making the, the nuts and bolts of, of interaction and how a game works. And I, this game really is about um, my obsessive compulsive tendencies. Um, this game really is, is about the stuff that I, I have going on, you know. Uh, what was that really funny movie that you were talking about where or that really funny scene in that movie about going to the moon where that little foreign guy just says the nasa scientist have you ever seen the inside of anyone's brain ah this is the inside of mine um so that's how i felt after i started writing this down what movie was that that was actually from the hbo series from the earth to the moon that, that was, was the, the one that was uh, episode six Sp uh spider if i remember correctly no, uh no no i take it back that was uh not episode six spider that was episode it was episode six, but the episode was called. Um, what was it? My control on it. Which one was it? This little rock, I think, is the name of the, the episode. Cool. Basically, the uh, in uh, it's it's the uh, summation of Apollo fourteen. Uh, so um, it's just after Apollo thirteen, where everything went to hell in a handbasket. But it's it's basically the whole episode deals with the training and the preparation for Apollo 14 as they're getting ready to go up and um, uh, and do all the science stuff up there. Uh, so Apollo 11, as you guys may remember, is the one where it actually landed on the moon the first time. That was Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin with uh, uh, Michael Chaffee up in the uh, command module. Uh, then we had Apollo 12, which was Pete Conrad and... Uh, Al Bean, who landed on the moon with um, Ed. No, who wasn't Ed White? I forgot who the guy. Thought you were going to say Ed Harris for a second, the actor from Apollo 13. <laughs> yeah, and he played Gene Kranz, actually, which was played by another actor. Who, actually, no, it was actually played by Ed Harris in this movie. You're kidding. No. I love spiritual because, follow ups see, like that. That's well, awesome. The, first of all, a lot of the cast from Apollo, Apollo the Apollo 13 <laughs> movie are actually in. Um, the uh, the, ser the series. In That's fact, cool. He, uh, Clint Howard's in there a few times. And you get to see him. It's like, hey, it's Clint <laughs> Howard. For those people who know who Clint Howard is, he's the one guy that uh, he's the brother of the director. Um, what's his name? Ron Howard. Ron Howard. Yeah. yeah. So Ron Howard always gets his brother in every movie he's got. So he's the one guy who's you know he's bald, has usually wears thick glasses, and he's the he usually plays real nerdy guys. Uh, he won a Lifetime Achievement Award from uh, MTV went back in the 90s. So for those of you who remember that, great. But um, the uh, 
so he's in there, and you get to see him. You see a, a bunch of other guys. Ed Harris is on screen for all five minutes as he plays his old character. But uh, you also get to see a lot of other characters, a lot, a lot of great actors in there, and playing different astronauts. And everyone is very faithful to their roles. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a great series. It was produced by Tom Hanks. It was done. Of course, it was done after uh, they did Apollo thirteen, and he wanted to do the whole space program thing, and. So yeah, they produced a series from the Earth to the Moon. It's a great series, worth a watch. If you guys can find it on DVD, I highly recommend buying it. If you just want to watch it, I would prefer you find it on some kind of legit science. I'm sure it's on HBO's app, mm. but uh, if not, just find some place where you can watch it. I'm I'm not being endorsed by anyone <laughs> to be careful, but it's just a great passionate. it's a great series. It's done again. Uh, Tom Hanks was really passionate himself in, the, in making the series, so he was real, a s- real stickler for all the details, and they got a lot of things right. In fact, I'm pretty sure they, it's about as faithful a recreation as you can get without um, a lot of things. The only, the only thing is they have to play up for drama. And, right. You know, the actors actually have to emote so you can not think. The, the thing about the Apollo 13 movie and a lot of other dramatizations is because if you relate to the real thing, it's real dull. <laughs> because that's I'm, hilarious. No, I be, because these guys are professionals. Mm-hmm. When, uh, when they're just handling it, yeah. Because yeah. when like the in uh, in, Apollo, in the movie Apollo thirteen, you you see uh, you know everyone's going like their sky, their harpies are, sky, are skyrocketing, and you know it's like Houston, we've had a problem. You yeah, know, and he's and they're they're just you know all panicking as they're rattling off. Right, and in real life they were more like Houston, uh, we've had a problem here. <laughs> Got a that's main funny. B undervolt. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it's literally like that That's for funny. the whole incident. Not once did anybody raise their voice. Everyone was panicking, but on the inside, nobody showed anything other than professionalism throughout the entire time. That's hilarious. But I do want to find that that um, from the Earth to the Moon because I want to I want to have that be one of our our transitions, one of our animations. Is that little guy going, "Look at the inside of my brain"? Because um, yeah. well, that's how actually, I feel I do about have this a series on, on on DVD. So oh, cool. If you guys want to, if you want to borrow it, I'll bring it by. But, cool. Uh, but yeah, that that scene. We uh, don't necessarily endorse at all. Or I shouldn't say necessarily, but we don't endorse taking footage off of a disc and, and doing your own things with it. No, not at all. We've never endorsed that. Um, that's right. that's definitely not so, how we're getting so our transition. We're not going to do that at all. We're, we're not at all. To find what are you talking some, about? Some how dare kind you? Of, uh, stock footage from someplace. Yeah, yeah, that's right. it. But anyways, um, the, the scene in question, which to get back to the where it was where this whole tangent started jumped off from, was um, there's a scene in uh, when they were preparing for Apollo 14, which was one of the ne- the next to last missions because it was. That was when they finally got the word that they were going to cance- cancel a lot of missions. So they're like, okay, yeah, Apollo 14 and 15 are going, and Apollo 16 and 17, and that's the last of it. And the thing of it was, the guy who was on the back of crew for 14 was one of the act- was an actual geologist. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, the, the rest of the astronauts were all pilots originally, test pilots. So they were, um, they're first and foremost there to fly the aircraft. Science second. Um, but that mission was, um, in the lead up to that mission, uh, this one guy, his name was um, uh, Jack Schmidt. Yeah, Harrison Jack Schmidt. And um, he, was, he was the only actual scientist. He actually did actually get up to the moon on, on seventeen. Uh, it was a last-second decision. They they swapped them out and they put them on, but uh, the uh, he was on backup for 14, and he was slated to be ca- to be on 18. They scrubbed his mission, so they were he was really gung ho about making sure that all the uh, astronauts got properly trained up in in field geology, which is what he specialized in, and uh, you know to be he was trying to basically push for them to become field observers, so. The Apollo 14 mission was the first time where these guys were actually properly trained to be proper field observers. So they weren't just out there picking up a random rock and just saying, okay, we got this rock and we're just going to sample it. It was, oh, okay, here's the rock. We're going to take a picture of that so we have a, you know, the context. We're going to describe it. And they're mm-hmm. literally rattling off the details of it <laughs> as they're getting ready to pick it up. And then they pick it up, examine it, rattling off details as they're going, and then they bag it. Mm. And it was the, that was the mission when they found uh, the, the the 
the primal rock, which was the anorthosite, which was the big thing that they mm-hmm. were looking for on the moon, but they found it on 14. Um, but uh, the scene in question was uh, when they were training uh, the guy who was going to be up in the command module, and they wanted to train him to be an aerial observer, essentially. And he was being trained by this one guy named Farouk Albaz. Great name, by the way. Um, and the guy was absolutely nuts. I've seen actual interviews with this guy where the actual... Farouk Albaz. He is just as crazy as he is portrayed on the show, even though he's portrayed by a much younger That's the actor. guy I'm identifying with. Oh, That's yeah. this guy. I mean, he, just walks, he walks up to uh, Colonel Warden. That was the guy. Um, he was, was like, so Colonel Warden, how are you? <laughs> Have you ever seen the inside of a human brain? Come, I will show you mine. And then he, by the time I... We, by the time I am done with you, your brain will look pretty much the same. And he walks him into literally the inside of this room that is plastered everywhere with photos and models of the moon. And the top of the of the room is a is a um, plaster sculpture of the moon, uh, like a like a, a faithful sculpture that he probably did himself. And he just gets up on the ladder. And he's like this is what the inside of my brain looks like. And he grabs a, a pull cue. He's like, project? He's like, crater Theophilus. <laughs> and he starts rattling off details and he just starts pointing without, without even looking at it. He's just pointing because he knows where every single thing he's pointing at actually is without oh, yeah. even looking up. And he's just looking down at the guy and the astronaut's just like, I have no clue, buddy. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of the reaction I got. No, <laughs> people were following me at least when I when I presented this to the class. So this this board is going to wind up looking like that room that John just described, um, or something like it. Um, so yes, this stark minimal minimal game board, which is exactly how I like to approach things. You know, I, I I've made lots and lots of um, game prototypes um, for. You know, um, games meant to be meant to be video games, and I always start with a paper prototype because that's just where I come from. You know, I'm a tabletop gamer, um, and that's how how I I was. Um, that's both my preference and and how I was trained in school. Um, so this super minimal tabletop prototype is gonna look like my crazy obsessive compulsive tendencies. Um, so yeah, we have here um, just a simple um, eight and a half by eleven grid. And if anybody is interested in in playing this prototype um, or anything like it, um, just um, hit us up in any of the ways that you can get a hold of of Mint Potion. You know, um, hit us up on Discord, hit us up on Twitch. Discord is still the best way to get a hold of us. Um, any ways that you can contact Mint Potion people. Um, I am Athastrophe on Discord, by the way. Um, are you on Discord, John? I am not, but I will be soon. Sounds good to me. Um, so yeah, we can. I can just send you this grid that I made, and I can send you ways to to make your own prototype pieces. Which is another thing I wanted to do with this with this show. You know, I realize it, it, I've never never failed to to see the power of stating the obvious ever since I started teaching. Um, it's it's really really easy to to throw a game up on on itch.io or or Twitch or something like that. But it's really hard. Graph paper. Graph paper, for yes. those little ones to an inch. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. So the. Uh, I have this graph paper here, which you could use if you guys don't want to print out the grid like that. And yeah. just basically, this particular graph paper is uh, four squares to an inch. So count yeah. four squares, get yourself a Sharpie, and mark them out. Exactly, yeah. And these these are just inch squares to fit the 25 millimeter um, bases that we're going to be using. Um, so yeah, um, um, it seems really obvious, but it's hard to find a community place to find ways to, to test your own games. Um, in general, um, outside of, of your friendly local game store. And even then, you, you run out of people pretty much pretty much the day you sit down to play it um, as far as people that you might get to help test. So that's that's what this, one of the things this show is all about, is being a test platform for our community's um, tabletop prototypes. Um, and I know that other, other tabletop gamers are out there. Um, um, so please, let us know. Um, uh, we will le- happily play your games on stream, um, or you can, you can um, email me lists of, of stuff that you use to play your tabletop games or your tabletop prototypes, um, and I can make them myself. You know, I made this out of scraps I had lying around my desk, literally, and I can do that with, with any type of game prototype. Um, so if there's something you would like us to play, we'd be happy to play your game on stream to help you test. You know, okay. uh, well, um, we have a volunteer we already. We do. Hi, Poppy. Okay, oh, Apo. 
sizzling young men. You want you to play my game? Cool. Well, let us... Enrique Fabuloso. Yeah, Enrique Fabuloso. Let you us go know. Ahead and, go ahead and send him the details, and we'll yeah. see about getting you started with Definitely. The, t- testing it out on screen yeah, for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, so let's get to the game. Um, this is a tabletop miniatures version of a game that I'm um, going to be going to be developing in the future. I'm not entirely sure if I even... Wa- Originally, it was going to be... Um, uh, a real-time, you know, uh, 3D action game, um, and I was gonna, you know, I was gonna make it in Unity with really simple assets and really cool stuff like that. Um, and then I, I sat down to play with my professor, um, and he said, you know, this is this is so complicated um, as is that it feels substantial and complete, and you could leave it um, as a board game, and it would it would be, you know, totally playable um, by just polishing this proto- polishing and publishing this prototype. So I'm not sure where I want to go with it. Um, he did, and I, I'll, I'll tell you this much, John. I've not told John anything about this game, and I did that conscientiously so that he would be learning everything as he went, as you all are. You know, you're going to be learning along with him. Um, my professor said this game is complex enough that um, it, y- I really ought to be prototyping um, in software. You know, I really ought to be doing this in Game Maker, even to keep it as a board game. Um, it gets that complex because this game, John, is all about time travel. Right. So that would be, it's going to be an interesting thing to keep track of. Yes, it is. And that is what this is for. That's one reason why we have, um, uh, you know, pen and paper game and, you know, paper prototype. Those are, those, are, those are our community's, you know, our community's terms and stuff like that for, for when you're playing, you know, tabletop games, basically, um, or when you have really, like, minimalist prototypes. But um, that's literally what we're going to be doing is we're going to be drawing on this piece of paper. Again, it's just a uh, piece of notebook, or I'm sorry, uh, printer paper um, uh, with a grid. Um, so... This is going to be a turn-based um, miniatures game uh, to prototype um, uh, to prototype the final version of it. So the final version is not going to be, you know, you might be familiar with publisher like Cheap Ass Games, where th- their final versions are really, really basic stuff. Like, you know, um, as the name implies, they're 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 meant to be cheap as hell. Uh, you know, you'll play like on the box it came in, and that's going to be your playing surface and stuff like that. This is not the final version of it. This is just a prototype. Um, but the way this works is John and I both start with models. Um, and as we go, we're going to be collecting the items that are on the board here. So that's what these dice represent. So these gray guys um, are going to be the NPC opponents. So they're going to be moving along a scripted path, and it's going to be our job to collect the um, the dice that you see here. So the backstory that I wrote for this game is really minimal um, because it's not, it's not a story-driven game. Um, it's that... Um, John and I are playing as thieves. We're, we're in the middle of a heist in a museum. Um, we find a time machine in the laboratory, and we, take the time, and we use the time machine to steal artifacts, which is what we were there to do in the first place. So that's what these dice represent, is you know, those are jewels or artifacts of some kind. Um, and of course, I'm going to have you know, more finalized assets for it. But right now, they're just dice. Um, so that's what these, these gray guys are all about. These are museum guards, um, and they are you know, patrolling around it. So they're going to move one square at a time um, around the artifact. And it's our job to sneak up behind them. Um, and we mean that literally. So when we say sneak up, we mean walk up behind it. Because the facing that each model has, I'm sorry, the, uh, the face that each model has um, is going to be very important. So, focus. There we go. So, um, whichever way the model is facing, literally the way the model's face is pointed, a model can see up the three squares in front of them. So, if I get my placing wrong and I wind up... I'm going to show you on this guy, just because he's better framed. If, we, if I wind up here, then I'm caught, because I'm in the, front, the, the three squares in front of him. So I want to come up behind him. And we're going to move one square at a time, and so are these NPCs. So for the purpose of... Who's moving the NPCs? That'll just be me. Just every every turn is a frame, and this is going to be one thing of movement. And um, these guys, just like an NPC would um, in a stealth game, um, they're going to be moving along a scripted path. So they're just going to be moving in a circle around this, around the collectibles. So as soon as, and just just like with a, an AI controlling 
controlling NPCs, um, you know, they're dumb. They're, they're moving along a predictable path, and it's up to us to avoid them, but that's not going to be altogether difficult. Um, I very, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I um, conscientiously designed this game to be boring in the beginning because there's not that much going on, and everything that is going on is really easy. But that's where things get interesting, is after you very quickly achieve the goal, which is just move on to the same square and you, you get the thing, you get to start over again. You get to start the same level over again, but you have... I'm just going to use John's piece to be quick. So let's say I start here, and I move along, and I eventually grab this thing. That is scripted movement for this character. This character... This actually past version of you, so it's the same character that the player controls, is going to do the same thing, and that's what, you know, depends for. Um, we're, every time we make a move, we're gonna, just going to draw an arrow, and then that's going to be the repeated move. You get another model, and that's going to be your now present self, and that last turn that you had, that's your past self. So the board's going to get more and more populated as time goes by, but you get to take the thing that you grab, you get to take the collectible, that's the point of the game, is collecting these things, um, and you get to place it again, and then your present self gets to grab that. And then we time starts over. So you're constantly going back to the same level, playing it through over and over again. So the board's going to get more and more populated, even though the size of the board stays the same. You can see your fellow player. That's not a thing. I'm sorry, that's not an issue. Um, but what's a thing is whether or not you see yourself. If your present slash past self sees your current or past self, um, then these two guys, um, they have, you know, they, it's the time travel paradox. Once you see yourself in the past, you can't handle it. And you're, you know, you blow your own mind. Um, you, you have a conniption fit. You have a seizure. Um, actually, that's one of, the, one of the inspirations for this game. Was um, a dear friend of mine um, is epileptic. And I saw him have a number of seizures in a very short amount of time. And it really struck me. Because I have, I have lots of friends with um, mental health issues. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it really is striking um, what they say. Where, you know, it's, it's an invisible, um, it's an invisible illness you know um but my friend who's epileptic you know when he has an episode it's it's really incredibly striking you know um it's totally apparent you know that he's having a seizure and what effect this has on him um so that was very striking to me and that's one one of the inspirations for this game as a matter of fact um so if you see your your former or current self then these two characters um then they stop exactly where they are. And that's one of the fail states. That's one of the things that triggers um going back to the start of the game. However their movements are still scripted. Even though your turn is now over, um, these two guys, you know, however they moved along, now that they see each other, that's what they're doing until the game restarts. So, John, your, your model can see mine at any, in any past or current version of it, and that's fine. And the same goes um, for me seeing you. However, we cannot see the models that we control or had controlled. So that first three squares are visibility becomes um, very important. Um, so the way that for the for this prototype, it's going to resolve a little bit like chess in that it's up to us to look over the board and realize, you know what, there aren't any other moves possible. And that's when the game's gonna end. So we, we have that kind of checkmate mechanic, you know, where we're just gonna look at the board and go, nope, that's it. We're gonna have to completely start over. So um, when you do things like um, get caught by guards, you know, that still plays out as you reset the level and play through it again. It happened in the past, but you still have to account for it. So figuring out what patterns to move through this level, which is just this gridded piece of paper, and figuring out um, things like timing and things like that, those are the kinds of things you're going to get wrong as you first play through it, but you're going to figure out the more you play it. So that is why what you see in the ticker down there um, is all is what I mean when I say this game is all about making mistakes and then living with them and then going back and trying to do better. So that's my spiel. Oh, and this is a piece of terrain. Um, you cannot ever be seen through it. So, you know, let's say this guard is, is here. Um, I, could, um, I could be here and my past self won't care if um, uh, I'm within those three, those three spaces, you know, if I um, if I'm here, then then I can't be seen. I'm considered to be hiding behind terrain. And in order to 
get out of your own way. Literally, you can climb up on top of this thing, but you have to wait a full turn next to it. So that's the time it takes to like climb up it. You know what I mean? Like when you're playing a game like Dishonored or Metal or um, yeah, Metal Gear Solid, um, it takes longer to climb up something than it does to than it does to walk or run. Um, so that's what this thing is supposed to represent. You have to stand stock still for a turn, but then you get on top, and then you're always out of line of sight. Um, so, without further ado, do you have any questions? Okay, so when you complete the level the first time, you get yes. the item, and then you just place what? You just place another one yep. anywhere? You get to place another one anywhere. Okay, and then it just keeps going until you literally cannot do anything anymore. You have filled the board with so many avatars that it's just no longer possible to make moves. That's a good word for it, avatar. Um, and yes. Okay. Cool. You seem disappointed. Um, just, I mean, it, it seems like a basically a slightly different variant on the game uh, Centipede. Because no matter how, I mean, no matter how long you play, eventually your snake is going to get to the point where it fills the screen. And I mean, the better players will get the longer snakes, and they'll get more, they'll get bigger and better chains. But instead of instead of having um, one long snake that you had to compete with, now you have multiple smaller snakes that can't that have to abide certain rules. But it's the same principle. It's like okay, the screen is going to get more and more cluttered with essentially yourself, mm. and at, uh, and the point of the game is you're trying to maneuver the, the yourself in such a way that you can continue to navigate the board without running into yourself. So. Interesting. Like say, basically, a, a, another. Cool. It's it's a it's a interesting variant on Snake. It's, so. Gotcha. This is certainly not the only prototype of this that I have. I mean, this isn't the um, this is the most basic version I have, um, and I definitely have a lot more going on. But I wanted to start with this most basic version. Okay. I, I got, definitely add a lot more to it's, it. It's not. A, it's more than a criticism. It was. Oh no just, no. Uh, just totally. An yeah yeah no. I, I welcome all of it. I want as much data as possible. I want as much feedback as possible. So even if you meant it as criticism, I'm I'm very happy to get it. Um, so yeah, and especially things like you know um, when I talk about like my obsessive compulsive. Um, tendencies that comes out a lot more clearly in the um um in the you know more advanced versions of this you know where i i throw in things like you know um fog of war and stuff like that and role playing elements like you know there's going to be a game master and there's going to be a bunch of different rooms all at once and you're controlling your past and current selves all at once on on different um different game boards and it's going to be different like parts of the museum and you're going to be scoring stuff and you know being caught um you know with various instances of yourself but you're you're going to be really successful in other other instances and stuff like that um so i still think it's important to start with this most basic version and see how see how it feels to actually play out. I uh, thank you for mentioning that though, because I was looking for games that have similar mechanic, and I did not realize that about Centipede, because I've I've never done that well at Centipede to realize that um, I could fill it. Not Centipede, Snake. Snake, thank you. Um, Centipede is a very different game. Yeah, yeah. That's funny. I thought you said Centipede, so I was just like, really? Wow, I've never done that. But no, I um I feel you now that now that I know you meant Snake. Okay, so um. Two, two yo, more questions for you. Absolutely. The, what determines the, the placement of the next item? When once you've completed your goal, you've snagged the item, mm -hmm. and this the thing resets. What determines where you place the next one? You can just choose a spot. You can just choose a spot. So you can make, um, you can make operator errors. That makes that really interesting, because um, that's definitely one thing that I wanted to um, that I realize is really important. Is that you know you shouldn't design a game around a perfect playthrough, or at least only punish less than perfect playthroughs. Um, so yeah, you can you can put a, um, a collectible wherever you want, but you might do stuff like make it only possible to run into a guard's path if you do that. Or make it possible to only run into the path of one of your past selves, which means that you either can't grab it or that your current self would, um, um, would lose because of it. Or you could place it um, in my path and I could grab it. So um, in this most basic version, nothing, nothing determines that. And um, you said you had a second question. Uh, yeah, that was the other question. Was it's you know obviously it's two players. So do would we have different starting spots and they just mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Um Starting position is wherever you want. So anything off the board is just considered like, you know, you're being super sneaky and then you found your door or window or what have you. So you have to walk in on one of these outer squares. 
So I figured that's that set up. So that's what I was going to get to next. So that's awesome. Um, cool. But first things first, um, we simply roll to see who goes first. Erft. Well, we don't exactly have a lot of room in here, so I don't know about rolling. <laughs> um, <laughs> there you go. Cool. I love these dice. I don't. They feel weird. They're too light. They're too light? I mean, I... These are the dice we're talking about. Call me old school, but when you roll a die, it should feel like rolling a die, not like earth throwing. Yeah. I I, I mean, I know they're well balanced. I know they're collector's dice, and I'm not knocking him for for buying them. I'm just saying. Well, we got a whole big dice bag. Two. Indeed. Thank you again for this. My good friend John gave me this. Oh, and we have, speaking one, of dice... One of many items I found in my garage one day. Yeah. I've had these since I was ki- a kid. They are these really weird... They're, they're spheres that have a weight in them. And then I guess, as I can hear... I'm pretty sure what they have... Dogen! Hi, Dogen! Die bag or dice bag? Dice. Yeah. It's yeah. A, well, technically... Uh, either, I think either term is technically acceptable because... It, it, you, I mean, the bag itself holds either one or multiple dice. Yeah. So a, a dice bag, I think, is what most people refer to, but it's still, I think, technically correct to call it a die bag. Indeed. Just don't call it a dime bag. Um, and <laughs> as far as whether you call it the, the singular die or dice, uh, that depends on what side of the pond you're from. Um, British, British people refer to a single of these things um, as a dice, um, but everywhere else, the plural is dice. I'm sorry, the singular is die. But yeah, I got these weird... They're just... Roll that and see how you feel. Yeah. Well, it doesn't... Uh, it doesn't exactly come up spades. Um, no, it doesn't the, even come up with a number. Yeah, the, I, I'm pretty sure what what's meant to happen here is that there should be... Or if I was designing this down, what I would do, what I would do is I'd have a polyhedron on the inside of this so that the weight has only one way to settle. Cool. That's either been worn down over time or it was never done properly the first to be. Yeah, I love so, hanging out with you, John. You already improved the design of someone else's dice. So, cool. Um, but in I the meantime, let's get you some real dice. Yeah. No, I just thought we were talking about dice, so I thought these ridiculous things were worth we were talking about. Um, but no. Um, they're like trying to be wrong. <laughs> Eight <laughs> dice. Okay. Yeah. Well. Yeah. To be fair. They started the language. But you know what? Actually, I found out recently. Well, not recently. I found out years ago that actually American English is closer to what the British used to sound like back in the colonial days. Interesting. Than modern English in Britain sounds like now. Interesting. All I know is we're right and they're wrong. So I yeah. like hearing the details. I like in hearing how it's true. What, when, another funny thing to note is that um, the literacy rate, uh, even though it's not... It doesn't really hold true anymore, but the literacy rate in the United States was usually higher in the United States than it was in Europe. That's funny. The I, I always bring, it was um, the reason why is because back in the colonial days, the they had very specific rules for how you set up your towns and and villages and cities and so on and so forth. So once you got to a certain size, your your uh, village or whatever it was had to have certain buildings so if you're if you're if you had like a little you know one horse town you know a literal one horse town where the population was like less than 30 and you had less than five buildings you could pretty much do what you wanted but as soon as you had i think 10 buildings you had the 10th building had to be a school the well actually it had to be a church the I was gonna say the um and then the next building after that was going to be a school so that people could learn to read their bibles and um you know people like to talk about how uh religion has sort of impacts well guess what one of the, the impacts of religion in this case was literacy yep so i i think uh, the statistic was at its highest that uh in america the literacy rate amongst colonists was, I think, 86%, hmm. which I think is still the highest pretty much worldwide with the exception of certain parts of the world today. I think uh, mm. I think 
Japan has the highest literacy rate at 92%. Really? Yeah. I thought some of those really small Norwegian countries that had like less than 7 million people, I thought they had like 100%. I know there it's are countries possible. that have 100, you know, yeah. You, you could be right. Again, I'm, I'm pulling a lot of these statistics from stuff that I glanced over years ago. So I could probably look it up. Mm. But the, uh, the, the point of the matter is that back in the, uh, in the colonial days, it was over 80%. It was in the 80% range for your average Joe colonist in America, whereas in, uh, in the... Uh, in your in England proper, the uh, literacy rate I believe was something along the lines of twenty three percent. Wow! And s- separation of church and state didn't do anything to drop that. That's funny. Yeah. Well, I mean, don't forget back in those days, also the average uh, uh, the average Englishman spent most of his day working in a factory where he didn't have to read. True. You know, that was back in the days when London. Uh, people in London suffered some pretty severe pro- health problems because they got no sunlight thanks to all the soot in the air. Yeah. Okay. Actually, that just messed it up. I tried to make this model look cooler. Right. They just anyway, made it hard to read. My digressions aside, well, let's go ahead and I enjoy start them. the game. I enjoy them. I mean, I'm, I know <laughs> there are people out there who probably like my digressions and his digressions as well, but the problem is we're actually trying to host a show here. You guys oh, are yeah. here to watch us play oh. games and not listen to me ramble on about American history. Well, they should expect both at this point. We've been doing the show for a while. Fair enough. Cool. So you rolled a one and I rolled a four, unless you want to re-roll those dice. I know you're not no, a fan. No, but I'm going to grab another dice in case we have to do another roll-off. Cool. Well, that's what these are for. Oh, there we go. Now we have prop... Wait, hang on. I'm sw- switching to workish. Now we've got proper dice. We don't get very far from 40K. You can tell from our stream frame, you know, that's, that's the shoulder pauldron... Of a space marine, and when we d- have different camera shots, you'll be able to tell more quickly. We're not going to get for and why are, why we have the super gothic heavy metal font um, down there at the bottom for our our, our the title of the show. And um, why we're using term uh, space marine terminators as our figurines. Oh yeah, definitely. And that's then, an imperial guardsman, and that's an uh, imperial captain. Oh yeah, and we're never going to get too far from the kitchen. I'm sure you've heard that term before. Oh, it's a great you know kitchen table game. I was gazing into our awesome uh, mint potions, awesome industrial kitchen wondering why don't we use this more often and i thought that it was part of the studio that didn't belong to us and we couldn't use it once i found out that we could i wanted to make real that phrase kitchen table game so here we are we're in a full production studio with industrial equipment in our industrial kitchen playing games with each other and actual food we actually did actually cook in here earlier oh yeah so this is a working kitchen. It does work. We actually yeah. do make food. We did, and we uh, we filled our bellies. It was really good. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to turn this into a cooking show. I'm sorry. No, no, no. We can make this a cooking show if we want to. No, no, we're not turning this into a cooking show. It's not we, yet. Uh, not yet. We we ha- we would have to have a lot of people sponsoring us to make yeah. this a cooking show because, quite frankly, the I ingredients would just cook alone are going to cost us a lot. I would just cook on our show. Um, but when we go when and you know we're not like leaving 40k or anything like that I just wanted to you know once we've worked out the kinks with all our new streaming equipment as needed for our show like you know stuff like new Ren and power or I'm sorry power block and and dog tracks and stuff you know that got figured out really easily um, it took us a while to to smooth everything out for our show um, that's one of the reasons why we stuck with 40k and stuff like that but we're not leaving it we just wanted to get to one of the other reasons why the show exists in the first place which is development so without further ado I am simply going to jump myself in here. Actually, let's just call this um, this cutoff part um, just to get things going. Let's just say it's not there. Um, I printed this here, um, which has different settings than my printer, so part of it got part of it got clipped off. Let's just say that this is the um, the first row. So go ahead and place your piece. Cool. So now that it's my turn, I do this and I record what happens including my facing by just drawing an arrow. Cool. So go ahead and take your turn. Oh, I'm sorry. We advance, and I'm, I'm, I'm the AI here. So I'm just going to be the one who advances the NPCs. Whenever you're playing a game like Dishonored or, or Metal Gear Solid, you can tell the path that the NPC guards are on. You know, So these guys are literally walking in a circle around the valuable. This is absolutely part of this actually beginning being very boring, and then that's what motivates the player to then add to it, to then do cooler and cooler stuff. Um, so I did that on purpose. I don't, we don't have to have a valuable and then someone walking around it in a tight circle, but I wanted to see how a player would react, you know? So 
Go ahead. Okay. Uh, here's the thing. I yes. think maybe you need to alter your notation just slightly. Alter the what? Alter your your notation just slightly. Uh huh. Because the the infographic you're using here shows the direction, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what your facing is. Cool. In that case. So I would suggest putting a line, a sort of. So if you were, let's say, facing in this direction, uh -huh. you came in this way, but you're facing this direction, just put a a straight line. Sure. Like that way. Cool. So, how about a vision? You know, vision cone is is you know how I how I was describing this when I first made it. So how about? Um, well, because if you have when you have multiple paths. Mm -hmm. No, no, I hear I hear the problem. I'm just thinking of a way to um, um, to note it. Um, yeah, how about how about just a line this way? I was facing that way. Yeah, that was cool. what, I, what I was gonna say. Oh, that's funny. Way. Awesome. Cool. And uh, you have a pen. Yeah, I have a pen. And also, I, it, since paths are going to cross, mm -hmm. um, we should use multiple color inks. Sounds good to me. Because. I was going to let that be part of the fun confusion of it, but at the same time... At the same time, we're Now going that you've to... made this note, and I want, to see, I want to see how your idea plays out. So, yeah, I have that okay. many inks. Sounds good to me. So we have black, uh, cyan, purple, oh, yeah. red, and green. We'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. I'm pretty sure we're going to run out, but... That's at fine. Least for, we'll be able to tell moment. the different paths. Um, but, yeah. So, I moved. Go ahead and move. So, I'm going to move this way. Cool. Mm -hmm. Oh, and you can move diagonally. Oh, that was another question I was going to ask. Yeah, but... sorry. I forgot to mention that. Super cool. Um, awesome. Oh, sorry, it was this one. I moved. Actually, you know what? I think I have fresh ink. Did you say fresh ink? Huh? You have what? Correction ink. Oh, correction. Oh, you mean white out? Yeah. Cool. Okay, so I used the words correction ink. Sue me. Pretty soon you're going to ask me to hand you a dice. <laughs> um, correction ink. I have ink. my screwdriver, but I do not have... That's funny. Correction ink sounds like chloroform. No witnesses. I don't want you to remember me making a mistake. Um, be careful, because I actually might have some of that in my backpack. Um, Why would you have chloroform in your backpack? Oh, because you made a mistake once. I mean... <laughs> well, I... I will say that mistakes were made. I won't say who made the mistake. <laughs> How come all this conversation about chloroform is jogging my memory that chloroform tastes like pennies? You know what? You're right. It does. And uh, but it's, you know, the reason, and that's why one of the reasons I also use ether, which doesn't actually have a taste. I'll explain why I don't remember it. Okay. So far, we just started. Two moves in. Yep, we went on a tangent, and then I explained a lot of stuff, and... Really? We went on a tangent? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, all right, then. So, I'm going to make my next move. The person that you cannot see or hear is our intrepid Matt Hall, our man of many skills. Before you move that, shouldn't the, the, the models move, or do you move first, and then the models move? You move first. Okay, so... I moved, he moved, so now he's going to move this way. And okay. Oh, did we talk and so forget to move a model? Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, because you moved your, your guy, and, mm -hmm. then, and, then, and now we're moving the, the troops. Yeah. Cool. So. I think I lost track of what we were doing, but we'll play it out, because neither of us would have been caught at this point. So for the purposes of the playtest, nothing's been messed up. Um, so. Let's just um, keep going. So go ahead. I just moved and marked myself. Go ahead. Cool. Taking advantage of the fact that he can't see to his immediate right. Yep. So. So. Sweet. Now this is the point. So this is the end of, of, of a round, basically. So we both... We keep going. We now get to come back with... So everything that we've just done, all the moves that we just made, are totally and completely still going to happen. But we now reset. So, pieces go off the board. That goes back there. But now... Did that move? No, that's exactly right. Uh, um, yeah. Can actually take a moment to use the red to actually cool. put a border on these so we know what squares... 
the um, Centurions are sure. actually starting in. It's it, it sounds pedantic, but I'm no, no, sure no. it'll come into handy. Yeah, later. yeah, yeah. No, I've only play tested this a few times, and it's going to get complicated. So that's actually a really good idea. Um, Cool. So what happens now is everything that had happened is going to happen again with the same models, but we're both going to have additional. This is what a professional looks like. You have the same little pencil case that you had when you were in elementary school, and you have your improvised models from the models that you bought when you were in middle school. The stream says we're playing Defend the Cake, says Dogen. Thank you for letting us know from yesterday. Okay, that's super cool. Um, can producer Ben or producer Matt please update that? That'd be great. Um, so yeah, so go ahead and pick your... Oh, he brought D&D &D models. That's awesome. Cool. Again, All right, then. Professional. Professional. Cool. Sweet. So, um... And I don't know how complicated this is going to get because we're going to go until basically checkmate, or we are going to go until uh, checkmate. So um, we might run out of however many D&D &D minis you have. Don't tell me how many. I want to be surprised. I want to see you keep pulling out like handfuls of D&D &D minis ad nauseum. Um, so yeah, let's. Let's start again. So I went first and placed here. And then you placed there. Cool. So... With the Doom of Democles over the guy's head. With what, what? Oh, the what, what? Oh, with the Doom of Democles over this guy's head. <laughs> actually, I think it's pronounced yeah. Damocles, but whatever. We're not from that side of the pond, so... Actually, no, it would be Damocles. Um, actually, I think I am from that... Well, my ancestors are from that side of the pond, but yes. Interesting. We're, we're super, super 40k nerding out. This sword is is a, a piece of equipment that has that has a backstory. Um... Uh, uh, uh. Apologies for not having much else to say. Not a big board game Not a big guy. board game guy. Casually. No worries. Thank you for watching at all, Dogen. We always love having you. Um, so, yeah. No, no, don't apologize. Thank you for letting us know. No, never apologize to us, dude. How are you, by the way? I hope you're well. Um, you know, thank you for well, the I'll stuff. Just, I'm just uh, here. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. Actually, that's a perfect stopping point. I'm going to change the battery in our camera, and I'll be right back. Actually... I have a that better idea. That other thing runs on batteries and isn't plugged in properly. That is bad, bad work. I should shame everybody who works here. Oh, wait, that includes me. Never mind. I, I take back everything that I just said. Why I'm speaking in this stupid accent, I'll never know. But I'll keep running with it until he finishes changing the stupid battery. Never apologize for accents, John. Never. That's how Scotty got hired. He had an okay audition, and then he just said, I actually like to do accents. Can I do an accent? And then they said, sure. And then that's how that character came into being. And I think of you, John, every time I hear that, because I know that that's simply how you would create a character, how you would. Actually, I usually create characters by creating, by just basically taking a stereotype and working with it. <laughs> so, uh, like, for example, I have, uh, just to pitch one of my ideas real quick. Uh, I have a current character in a D&D campaign. His name is Kale. He is Come a on. human monk. And you're... you're yeah. We're okay. back on. So I'll tell you guys the rest of this when the next time he has to change batteries. Cool. No, I'm kidding. I'll finish. I'll finish, I'll finish this real quick. Uh, again, I just went with the whole idea of just monk, nice. you know, uh, what happens when, you know, you have a uh, sort of like a Shaolin-style monk when they're actually trained from, you know from a young age and I actually looked into it and did some research so I found out that actually yes they actually do accept um, aspirants as young as three years old uh, to actually train in the Shaolin style um, and they actually live that lifestyle for you know growing up mm. so I was wondering well what would happen if you had someone in a relatively medieval setting going ah source monk in oblivion nice oh cool way cool uh, but yeah Ooh, I, are you running mods I know I'm interrupting you. I'm sorry. I just I'm I'm too curious. Uh, Noise. Well, he gave us a figurine, so He gave us a figurine. It's men smiling. Oh. A few mods. A few nice. Mods. Okay. Awesome. Super cool. Sorry to derail you, I just that's that's such a juicy topic. Right. Don't like using too many Well yeah, because especially after if, if you apply too many mods it'll crash your game. Yeah. And, and that's kind of a thing because all the mods start interfering with each other. Yeah. But uh yeah. 
But yeah, no, I, I basically started with the idea of this character who basically would be a, sort of a Shaolin style monk, where it was well, what if he was raised, you know, again from birth to basically being just a a, a martial artist, you know, mm-hmm. sort of the 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 Ryu sort of uh, archetype, basically. So right, right. if you guys don't know, uh, in the actual story behind Street Fighter, the game, and yes, there actually is a story behind the game. Uh, I love it. I, I love it. I love it. Uh, but uh, Ryu and Ken both studied under the same master since they were kids. Um, well, kids is maybe a strong world. They were both in their early adolescence. Uh, when they started, but they they both studied under the same master for many years, and they basically grew up together. Um, so that's why they're both friends and rivals. Uh, and if you notice a lot of games, they'll do like a little friendly sort of you know fist bump before they actually start to fight. Because it's basically them just doing what they've been doing for years, growing up. It's just them trying to figure out which okay, how, who's improved more over the years. Um, but anyways, but yeah, the the whole archetype I was trying to go with for when I made Kale was that he was going to be essentially a Ryu, um, mixed with a little bit of Goku and a few other sort of monk-ish characters, and uh, and then I just basically just took what the DM gave me from the world and went from there. So very cool. You don't need the complete backstory to Street Fighter. What are you doing here? I right. Know, well, I know. Right. I know it, but I'm not <laughs> sure how many other people know it. Um, <laughs> Uh, we, we we said that as someone off camera was coming right through a door after a after a conference call exactly as I was reading that out loud going right so that was perfect I got quite the reaction out of that man that's awesome God I'm glad that got that was on camera okay all right so back to the game We're yes indeedy doodle so um we can sense. drop in whenever we want we have we have we have that ability we have um, the technology we have the technology we do we are we are thieves who found a la- who, who found a laboratory with a time machine in it dude um, so we literally have the technology so um, it's my we, turn and you said we can move the diagonal right? absolutely right, yeah i'm sorry i forgot to mention that that's entirely my fault as the as the game master um, here's another question yes what happens if all the or what happens if let's say uh, oh a spooky ghost l- a spooky ghost. Like we saw. Oh. Here. Hold on, really quickly, Andrew. Just so you can. No, no, no. Show him your shirt. Just, just to make sense of what I was talking about. Yeah, we're being haunted. We're being haunted. Yeah. The, the sauce might be need to warm up a little bit so that you can warm up. Oh, okay. Or, yeah. Know, yeah. That's, oh yeah. That's, that's the sauce. That's the thing. Actually, it should be fairly warm. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, because these will keep things pretty warm for quite a while. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, but but you I might love want, working you might in a kitchen. Toss that in the micro for a few seconds. Sorry, folks, for talking. On, oh no. On, on line for that, but not at all. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and you yeah. probably need less sauce than you think, so <laughs> try not to overdo it. Yeah, we made. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's not. It's not that it's overpowering. It's just that the sauce is. Um, Good. Well, well, because the. <laughs> we made well, that, but also. Fettuccine and kielbasa just, with a it's just cause the, the, the Cajun roux. Who, who, who added sauce literally put so much that he did not need to add sauce to the second plate. He just used what was left on his plate. Isn't he left on oh, the first yeah. time. Yes, they're still still alive. Ben, 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 that's one of the reasons. Kitchen. That's one of the reasons Someone why I wanted to be in here. It would, I knew it would be lively. I knew we'd see the other wonderful mint potion people who are normally behind the scenes. So that was that was our good friend Andrew, um, DJ Boosh. Yeah, an incredible software engineer and incredible musician, um, along with Matt Hall, um, our producer and uh, one of our one of our jacks of all trades. Um, so yeah, um, back to the game. We can drop in at any time. Yeah, that was the question I was going to get to actually, which was. Um what happens if one of the previous models grabs the package and um, before we grab our package on our current turn? Right, 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 right. That I'm glad you asked that. That's part of that's part of the complexity that emerges. Is that um, it's up to you as the player to get stuff done within that time. So okay, fair yeah. enough. Yeah. So that's 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 another one of the things I conscientiously didn't tell you is that you know that's time, which is going to determine um, you know how quickly the game ends and stuff like that. So you can drop in anywhere. 
you just can't be seen. So you can continue dropping in here and here and here, but in the two turns that it took you, yeah, two turns that it took you to get that, you know, um, that's one of the reasons I'll tell you now that we're at this point, why it is that I started here in the middle of nowhere, when you can tell that I wasn't going to score score as soon as you were, um, was um, because this literally gives me room to do stuff. This literally gives me space, literally space and literally time to drop more collectibles for my past self to go to work for me. So when I first thought of this game, it was, you know, it was, this is going to be, um, you know, a 3D real time stealth action game. Um, but it becomes, cause when I'm, when I'm playing Dishonored, which is, which is my biggest, you know, video game inspiration for this. Um, when I'm playing Dishonored, you know, I love when the really tense moments turn this, you know, really careful, slow stealth game into more of a race, you know, like you can see the paths everyone's going to take. And, you know, it's not a matter of figuring out how to sneak up on someone. It's how to get somewhere fast enough. So you just set the pace for the rest of the game, John. Well, okay. Cool. Uh, it is your turn. So. Yes, indeed. Really quickly, though, Dogen says, um, you don't have to stop playing to eat. Exactly. Best spot. And Dishonored was great. I've, not, I've actually not played Dishonored 2. Um, once you start making games, you lose time to play them, as, as, as we all hear but that's 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 a hard thing to feel. But yeah, no, I haven't played Dishonored too, but I can't wait for it. Um, so yeah, so I can, and you know, you can, you don't have to move. You can wait for all the pieces to advance before you start dropping yourself in. Um, I'm not going to do that though. Um, also, you can um, now that you've grabbed a piece, it exists in the past. That first piece that you grabbed, you get to place another one. You have grabbed it, and now you can throw it to yourself yet again. So go ahead and place that before we do anything else. Cool. I can't imagine what he's going to do next. Um, so I am going to drop in. And I am going to drop in here. And he's going to drop in there. So you're going to snag yours first, but technically cool. as soon as he, the guards move forward, we all move forward. We both grab our prizes, and then it's the next. Indeed he do. Probably the best successor to the AS. I haven't played Deus Ex either, Dogen. I know. I'm a terrible, terrible stealth gamer. Have you? You've never played Deus Ex. I have homework. I, I have... I have played the original Deus Ex, uh, the sequel, in, uh, which was absolutely shite, but oh well. That uh, sucks. Uh, which, which sequel? I gave it a bunch. The, se the second one, which was Invisible War, it was... You didn't like Invisible War. Yeah. Invisible War had an excellent soundtrack. I have to say it had an excellent soundtrack. The game itself was nigh unplayable. Interesting. And also because it was such of all time. a departure from the original. That's quite a thing. I love getting to know our community through stuff like your favorite game. I'm, it's really cool how that came up. Um, that's dope. Okay. Yeah. The, the, original, the, uh, the original one is, is definitely, even today, is still worth playing. Uh, just dated graphics and all. Um, because it is so well written, it is so well executed that you don't really, you know, you're going to get smacked in the face with the graphics in the first five minutes just because they're 90s graphics. I'm sorry. Love they are, I love it. I mean, yeah, yes, it's a great... Ex um, it's a great aesthetic for some people who like them, but yeah, uh, sounds more nostalgic than anything. But that's cool. Uh, Played in two thousand. Played it last year for the first time. Oh, oh crap! Um, I almost died there. Um, that's a cool endorsement. Ooh, something's going on with our chat. Yeah. Yeah, going I'm gonna fix that just because um, we're gonna get distracted by that. So I'm gonna nip that in the bud. I'll be right back, everyone. More he's gonna get distracted than I am, but yes. Uh, but yeah. it's text. You're a human being. You're gonna try and read it. Whether you whether you like it or not, it's going to get to you. Uh, but yeah, I I played the first one. It was it was awesome. It was an excellent game. Uh, and then I played Invisible War. Horrible game. Uh, again, excellent soundtrack. Uh, ambitious for what it was trying to do, but unfortunately it was too much of a departure for what, from what the original was. Cool. And also, they really missed the point of the first game, I think. Um, so that, there's that, um, but, uh, but then, uh, I played, um, the, the, one of the latest ones, which was, uh, da not Mankind Divided. That was, that was the, the sequel, but the, the mm. first one, the first of the reboots, which was Deus Ex, um, Human Revolution. That one was a worthy successor. 
Uh, so yes, Deus Ex Human Revolution, I definitely sign off on that one. Went right back to its roots, went back to its non-linear gameplay, went back to uh, giving you the option of how you play, so you could choose to either stealth in, or you could choose um, to... Uh, you know, to go in guns blazing, whatever, whatever flo- floated your boat. That was it. Gave you options to do all of that, mm-hmm. and it was an awesome game. It really was um, worthy successor, and it's a, technically a prequel because it happens before the original Deus Ex. Mm. Uh, and then the game after that, I actually did not play Mankind Divided. I hear mixed reviews about it, and eventually someday I will get around to playing it. But as far as I know, it is also a, de- a decent game. Maybe not as good as Human Revolution, but uh, Definitely good. Gotcha. Uh, the, uh, unfortunately, the only real negative criticism I have for either for any of the Deus Ex games is that ultimately your decisions don't matter. Interesting. Um, well, I mean, they do and they don't because um, uh, the, um, the the options you take in the game will help you to unlock the possible endings. But the at the at the end of the day, it's basically you choose a number. Mm. It's, like, it's like you choose which fate you want. Not that sucks. You have done X, Y, and Z. Therefore, this is the outcome you get. No, it's literally well, you have done the conditions to unlock this ending. So this button will be literally unlocked at the end of the game. Mm. Uh, and then if you completed the other options, you can choose one of the other buttons. But then after that, you just get to basically just push your button and choose your ending. And that you sucks. can literally save the game right before the end and see oh, all that's of Im- the endings. That's important. I like that, though. So that's cool. It's yeah. uh, It, it kind of takes away from it because, like, you know, it's like, well, I just played this entire game and really doesn't matter. It just comes down to my last second decision. Mm. But... Again, still, aside from the slightly slightly sad ending, mm. or, well, sl- sad way of choosing the ending, because the ending themselves were pretty cool. But uh, the sad way of choosing the endings, but still you get to, it's kind of like Mass Effect, now that I think about it. The same criticism everybody had about the ending oh, of, the, I of never Mass even, Effect 3 yeah. was that ever, basically... That you, turned me off to the whole series. I have no interest in even playing the first one. Oh, no, you deserve. You owe it to yourself to play the first. Two. You play all three, really. Really. Because I played the first Mass Effect again. No, even knowing what was gonna, have, what the problem was with the last one, mm-hmm. I played it, and it was. Uh, I had taken a week for vacation. I had planned a lot of things. Out. I didn't do anything other other than play Mass. I Effect. remember that story. That's. I played Mass that's Effect beautiful. for thirty some odd hours straight. That was uh, that was an experience. Yeah, I'm assuming you hydrated and and well, used the yeah, facilities. I, I and paused, yeah, I paused okay. every so often and, and used the facilities, but uh, <laughs> and you know occasionally ran off, grabbed a quick whatever I could throw together in the kitchen and just munch on it. But I played that game from sundown to sun up the day after. That's impressive. And uh, and I literally didn't stop until I realized, holy. Crap, I've played this game for 36 hours. I really <laughs> need to shower and sleep. That's impressive. So, yeah, but yeah, let's... You, you really should play it. It's really good. It's worth It's worth your time and effort. Interesting, because uh, I started playing it when it came out, but I was in high school, so I don't... No, I don't remember it. But yeah. let's get back to the game. So, so uh, yeah. We uh, we both dropped in. We both dropped in. We uh, advanced the models, correct? Yes, indeed. And we advance these other models too, correct? You can move if you so choose. You can move your your new character. Oh well, no, I thought the other models advance and then we choose to our move after that. Or well, yeah, um, with the way that we place them, then yes, that's where we'd go. Sorry, things are already getting a little more complicated. So now, um. Now, now you can you can choose to turn. move or to pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it it is still your turn first. So you get to. Yes, indeed. So. Cool. And. Hang on, I just make that a little more clear. Oops. And yeah, he's cut off the vision, so he can't see. So correct, cool. 
All right, then. So technically, because he can't see me, even though I'm right next to me, mm -hmm. so I collect the second one. Yes, indeed. And then we get cool. to place the next. Uh, we get to reset. Mm -hmm. Which actually, let me make a notation. That which color did you use for the second one? You use black again. Okay. Well, I don't think we're going to need multiple colors in this case. Because... No. Exactly. Well, we might though. We might. Because but... that's the thing. Because like you, so you definitely earned one from the first round. But then you scored your second one faster um, in the second round. So you do go up by one, but you can time it so that once this guy grabs one, he's just going to stay there because that's when his timeline ended. You could have earned, um, it with as we take multiple turns, um, you can, and I'm using turn and round interchangeably. I know that there are lots of games where, that, where they mean different things. They mean the same thing for, for this game. You can, you can earn more for yourself in the same amount of time. So that's another area where things um, are going to get more complicated. So you see how I didn't score this round? I can, because um, everyone who did score, even though this round didn't last the extra turn for you to actually score it, you did that already in a previous playthrough, literally in the past. So you still get the points for it. So um, uh, the same is going to happen there, where you're going to consider to have grabbed it, then this is going to play out. So you the, the round only actually stops. And again, this is the kind of thing that I didn't explain up front because it's way easier to show than to tell. Um, the round only actually... We actually stop playing only if our present selves scores. Everything else plays out in exactly however much time it takes. Hmm. So all of this, I'll score in one round. That um, stops being beneficial to you um, because you can simply do more with more time, literally. Um, I read once that, that games are art made literal, and that has been a big inspiration for me. Really, really one of my, one of my guidelines. You know, I want to take the idea of, of doing things um, you know, abstractly and making them literal. You know, that's, that's one of the things that, that I learned. Um, one of the things that, that really everyone I've ever talked to gets out of games is just that when they say, I did this in this game, they did do it. They just did it, you know, within the game. You know, you can't say that we didn't move around grabbing stuff. It's just that John and I, you know, we didn't use our person to grab something like that. We made those decisions and we made them real. We were self-actualizing. We just did it through... Crap. Sorry about that. We just did it through the game. Um, so you're literally going to benefit yourself um, in the short term with all this scoring in the first, you know, first chance you get. Um, benefit yourself less. And I, I'm sure you've realized this, but with all the quick scoring that you've been doing, you're now surrounding um, the stuff that you've got. Um, um, you're clustering, you know, the guard model along with your model. Um, and so um, there are more people that you have to avoid. Um, one of the things that's probably going to come through in this playthrough, um, if we if we do play it to the end game, which is that checkmate mechanic. Um, but I don't know if we'll have time for that because I'm not sure. You know, we're the last we're the last stream of the night. You know, basically, I don't think the, I don't think the stream will go on for two more hours. Um, but I'll say that um, just in case. Um, it's later than I thought. Um, which is that really one, one of one of the things that I one of the visuals that I got when I was first prototyping this was just the idea of just a really big conga line of people sneaking up on each other. Like there's one guy who's sneak up, sneaking up on someone, like like in any other game you've ever seen, um, you know, stealth game you've ever seen. But then wouldn't it be funny if there was a guy behind him, and then someone behind him, and then someone behind him, behind him? Behind him. It behooves you to sneak up on yourself in such a manner in this game. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, I was watching a Halo video where they have those really cool executions. Um, and some guy, you know, was walking around. And you can see the story unfold just with one character sneaking up behind another in multiplayer. Okay, this guy thinks he's badass. He's going to do an execution. There's someone behind him. Um, in the more advanced versions of this game, it, the, the role play, uh, more advanced prototypes, definitely in the final version, um, there are going to be things like Fog of War, where you know how we can see all the... All the um, pieces on the board here, there's going to be um, a version of this game where you couldn't see any of that. You're only going to see your present self unless you actually use your range of vision, which is going to be completely different, to see another model. So um, you're going to have role-playing elements like, I can hear someone behind me, but I'm not going to turn around because I'll see my former self and have a seizure. So you're going to know someone's behind you and you're going to try to not look at them. And it's going to be a moment of, ten of constant tension whether or not you are being snuck up on by your opponent or whether or not you're being snuck up on by your former self 
to maximize your space and time. So that's going to happen eventually. It's just like you'll hear footsteps, and then eventually you might hear a pause and then more footsteps. It might be one of your opponents, and that's not even part of this basic prototype, is the opponents actually competing other than scoring before each other. Is we, you know, there's there's going to be combat in this game and stuff like that. So you, know, it, you might have someone just come up behind you and grab you and then spin you around, and then all of your friendly versions of yourself all just drop to the floor immediately. You know, you can do something like mess up a chain like that, you know, and it's all about that thinking to yourself, do I turn around and see my past self and lose, um, you know, have both those characters drop dead, interrupting that timeline potentially, or do I just trust this guy I'm playing with to not screw me over? You know, that's, and I didn't want to get too much into the backstory that I wrote, but that's part of, that's part of the story, is that you're part of this team of, of thieves and you're all there just, just to get, you know, you're not friends, you don't know each other, everyone there is Smith, and you're wearing a ski mask and stuff like that. So even if you see someone in the distance running around, it might be, it might be you, and you might not want to sneak up on yourself, but it might be your opponent, and maybe you want to follow that guy, see what he's up to. Um, but yeah, um, that is for a different show when we're playing one of the more advanced prototypes. Unless you're getting really inspired and you want to play one of those advanced versions deep into the night as it's already almost mm, 10.30. I didn't yeah, think so. Unfortunately, I, didn't I, think I, so. Have a, uh, I have a paying job in the morning. Me too. Which, uh, which means that sleep will be a good thing tonight. Yeah, definitely. Plus, I, I, you know, I really overdid it yesterday on the physical exercise. So. Oh, I did it yesterday. I, I, I did it to my liver. I did it to my liver. But anyway. It's your liver. What did you do? Hmm? What did you do to your liver? Oh, just imbibing enriching substances. Right. I ran. It's chloroform. I, I took all the chloroform I could and got a great night's sleep. It was great. I slept for 19 hours, but... Um, but I yeah. got tires yesterday, and uh, because I did it while we were on break. And they're so expensive, he started running. He's just started running to counteract the cost. Actually, no, what happened was I had to drop it off during the first break to, uh, uh, where I was actually working, and we get 15-minute breaks. So I was like, oh, okay, I'll just go ahead and drop this off so that the guys can have these tires installed, and then I'll have someone from work give me a ride back. It shouldn't take more than 15 minutes. I didn't expect the guy to take 15 minutes to actually go start looking for my tires in the shop. So I literally just to turned to my, I turned to my um, co-worker who had get, come to give me a ride back. I told him, go back, because I have no idea how long this guy is going to take. And if, if someone's going to get in trouble, let it be me and not both of us. And so I sent him back. The guy finally showed up, gave me all the things I need, that I needed, and then I had to run from the tire shop all the way back to the office. It took me all of 10 minutes running. And that was a mile and a half. He's just... No, how far quite, was it? It wasn't quite that far. It was... City oh, bye, block. Dogen, by the way. Sorry to interrupt you. I, I got really into describing the future version of this game, and, you know, Dogen, good luck with what you're working on. Sorry to interrupt you. No worries. But yeah, uh, I don't know. It could have been about a quarter mile, maybe less. I don't know. How far was it? It was about a city block. Mm, that's I cool. I went two lights, two lights, and across the parking lot and took 10 minutes. Mm. So, yeah. I know from the. From one light from from one light to actually my desk, it took seven minutes, and getting to that light probably took about three. So, mm. yeah, about ten minutes. I and I just sprinted as fast as I could. The good news is it was downhill for the the run back to the office. <laughs> um, You're a practical man. The, I'm about to say it just sucks that you had to do that in the first place, and you just no sooner do I think it, you goes, well, it's downhill. It's fine. The good, yeah, the good thing was downhill, though it it actually was really horrible to do to run downhill because for any of anyone who's oh, ever yes. actually Come, run downhill, more. always. Anyone who's is there going to be some after you have your? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. There's, there's plenty. Anyone who's ever run downhill sh w would know that when it's almost impossible to land on your toe. <laughs> You always land flat-footed or heel first, and it is the worst way to run. And my legs are killing me today because I did it. But then, I, and then, what? What the the other part of the story is that later at lunch, I had to run back to get my car. <laughs> 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 have you ever worked on this pasta? Crazy? Oh, that was, was John, was Matt, team. John, Matt, and Ben. Everyone but me. Everyone, but, well, everyone but us. Yeah. Yeah. 
It was yeah. team effort. Uh, yeah. yeah, you and I eating all their all their work is is exactly how I wanted today to go. It's great. He beta tested the sauce. Love it. <laughs> you actually made the roux, stirred everything in, and added the cream. No, I, um, I was gonna say. I was like, hang on. I minute. think it means he ate it. Yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well. We, yeah, because you do know that that sauce isn't all that we did. Because we took that sauce, we, we made a roux, we made a blonde roux, yes, yes. and then we added the sauce to, to the roux and then added cream. Even without the sauce, like, it was still pretty good. Yeah, it, was, it's, it is excellent even without the sauce, okay, but, but yeah, the sauce cool. just adds that last little element. It adds the, the much-needed garlic and the much-needed other things to it to make it really pop. For those of you still listening on, on the stream and getting hungry, I apologize for nothing. Thank you, John. I was about to say I apologize for nothing because you had me going. I thought you were I thought you were apologizing. No. Actually apologizing. No, I am quite proud of what we made back there. And quite frankly, if you could be in here and try this stuff, you'd agree it's pretty damn good. But mm -hmm. you can't. So uh Nana Nana Boo Boo. Sorry. Nana Nana Boo Boo. Uh, we, it's uh, it's uh, television, not smell vision <laughs> Oh, I missed that word. Anyways. It is, in fact, your, still your turn. Yes, indeed. So, oh, actually, we're supposed to reset. Yes, indeed. No. That's okay. So, placing the, the next... Uh, so, I scored two yes. points for that round or just one? You scored one this last turn. You get to place two, and I know I might sound patronizing, but I just want to make sure it's clear because, excuse me, we're dealing with time travel. It's going to get complicated. I already switched it. Yeah. Do you know where the DC adapter or AC adapter battery went? It exists somewhere. <laughs> yeah, no. We'll be fine. Just making sure the camera's got a healthy amount of battery. Cool. So. So you told me to place two, I placed two. Yes, indeed, he doodle. Cool. So. I drop in. And this guy drops in. We advance. Hang on. The other models drop in also. This guy drops in over here. My guy drops in over there. That was after, oh, that was after, that was after the move, yeah. So, these guys move. Cool. Now, I dropped in. Oh, I'm sorry. They moved. Now I dropped in. You dropped in. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. that's right. You placed that there. Cool. So, now everything that we've done is scripted. So, even though there's now something right in front of that character, you know, what this is going to represent, because, you know, it's turn-based to represent everything happening simultaneously, even though we're not going to be moving models at the same time. Um... Fun fact, that's why tabletop games um, are so prevalent. That's what they're supposed to represent, is things happening simultaneously, but people aren't physically in each other's way trying to move stuff at the same time. Um, so yes, um, what this would represent with there being um, a collectible now within the range of view of that model is something just, bloop, appearing out of nowhere um, because you know that's what your past self would do would just make it appear without making themselves seen this character is still going to grab that though you know they're still going to be going huh what was that while well, they're still going after the thing in front of them so you're not going to be able to change what you did with this character but that is now placed there for literally the rest of the game no i realize that cool it's mostly for the people watching at home mm -hmm. but yeah no that's that's why i i brought you in on this because i know that you're you definitely understand how to play tabletop games. I, that is not at all for your benefit. So, um... You need a new model. No, I moved this guy. Well, I mean, I, I could drop in, but I, I choose not to do that. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to take it back. This game ain't chess. Yes, I made a move and I took my hand off it, but I am going to take it back to drop in. I was going to I was gonna move that guy forward at first and I decide. Um, I'm changing my mind. What can I say? Um, different model. Okay. So, and you have plenty of D&D &D models there. Okay. So, um, this guy is not going to move yet. What I'm going to do now um, is drop in one. Cool. 
So, as I mentioned before, with the whole um, it behooves you to sneak up on yourself, it's only if you see your past self and you're both in the same um, range of vision. So, like, this would be a move that would cause both of the... Um, uh, both of the uh, models here um, to meet the um, the fail condition, which is, oh no, they've seen each other, and now um, you lose whatever you, I haven't scored anything, um, but you lose whatever you would have scored because you've interrupted this model's timeline with this uh, move, um, and then that's the now, you've changed the past. That's that's you re-scripting what it is that had happened. You know, you're both now having a conniption fit or a seizure, or you know, you're you're not able to handle what it is that you're seeing. But that's only if you're within each other. If you you know, you meet each other's eyes. Only if your fields of view overlap. I could be there. So like my current self is now in the uh, field of view of my past self, um, but that's still legitimate. Um, so. We haven't even gotten to that point yet, which is where the board gets so full of stuff, eventually that's going to be a thing. Um, but right now, um, uh, that's not my play. Right now, I set myself up there. Um, so, um, I have dropped in. And now, it is your turn. Forgive me for going slowly. I'm considering stuff to do. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. That's the first time anyone I've playtested this with has done that before. Great. Nice. Now you can figure out what the hell's supposed to happen now. Yeah. No, but that's good though. You can, you know, I was obviously going to score with this guy eventually, and then script stuff in the future uh, with this guy eventually, and then script stuff in the future. But um, now you're simply going to beat me to it. You have you have snuck in in front of me, knowing, knowing what um, is that a ringtone? Yeah, that's awesome. Um, that's my what my text. That's funny. I'm so glad you got rid of um, message via sir, because even I heard it enough that one day. Yeah, there. I uh, for those of uh, Matt swinging of, a bat threateningly at us off camera. Yeah, uh, for those of you who don't know, I actually. Um, well, obviously, you guys don't know. You, this was never before. The, the if podcast. you were there, my God, we want to meet you. Um, we um, again. <laughs> yeah, if you were there, you, we we know who you are. We know the people in the room. But we know who you we are. We knew all the people in the room at the time. But yeah, uh, I uh, I used to have a, a ringtone in my phone called. Uh, His for, phone keeps um, going off. Yeah. I had a ringtone on, on my phone for when I received text, which was from the movie Monty Python and the Holy Grail. It was the moment where... Message for you, sir. Yeah, it was when uh, uh, Lancelot's uh, squire got hit with an arrow, and he just goes, Message for you, sir. And it was played by Eric Idle, by the way. Oh, yeah. So There's a message tied to the arrow, so... And he just says, Message for you, sir. And yeah, so I... Um, I used that for the longest time because it was awesome. But then uh, there was one one day... John was DMing like three different D&D campaigns, and he got literally three I, messages a second for several minutes yeah, in a row. I just got flooded with it so many times. I mean, I was always starting to get kind of sick of it, but we uh, but that day... I within a course of an hour, I must have gotten something like fifty to sixty messages, and they weren't even bad. for me. They were a group text, and they were texting to each other, and I just kept getting ponged on it. And I, you know, I mean, I thought at first I was like, well, whatever, they're going to shut up in a minute, and I just let it go, and I didn't bother turning it on silent. But after about the thirtieth or fortieth <laughs> time in as many minutes. Probably less, actually. Now that I think about it, it was probably more like along the lines we'd gotten about um, in the course of maybe 10 minutes, I got 30 texts. I had had enough. I nearly threw my phone and said I stopped, I stopped everything I was doing. He threw his hat, not his phone. I, I don't remember that, but I might have. You were throwing it in your hand. I, I might have. I, I, I honestly can't recall, but I will, I will say that I went and turned my phone on to silent and and it still was vibrating afterwards. I was like, I'm like, geez, what the hell is going on? What are they talking about? They were talking about going to go see a movie. That was the long and short of it. And I wasn't, I was part of the group that long were hanging out. It was my D&D group. They wanted to go catch a movie. And uh, I think it was actually The Force Awakens, I could, if I remember right. Did you punish them in game? I did not. You I should have, have punished them in game. I am not a, vind a vindictive DM. Um <laughs> I only punish people for doing something that really deserves being punished for, and that's only stuff that they do in game. I never let what happens outside of the game influence the. So, bribing the DM does not work in my game. 
unless you buy me something incredibly valuable or something <laughs> that I will almost, you know, that I will gladly go into your lap for. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if if you do that, then you can pretty much write your own ticket. But uh, but no one's ever going to do something like that in my DM games. I'm pretty sure. So yeah, that's. Uh, that's uh, actually a uh, fun story, but that's for actually another stream. Uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, but yeah. So I had that. I got sick of it, and I basically went looking for it. And now the, the new tone, ev the t tone ever since has been um, Edie from Mass Effect saying data received analyzing. Oh, that's what that's from. Cool. Yeah. So bringing it full circle to Mass Effect. Cool. Alrighty. So who's turning? It's, it's been a while. Uh, it's my turn. Placed everything, so it's yeah, you dropped in. Yeah, I, I dropped. You dropped in. I dropped. I in. dropped in. You dropped in. And you, now it you is are, time to advance the models. Yeah, didn't change the past, but you're changing what I'm going to be doing, and that's cool. That's cool. Inter uh, in between. Cool. So let's move the guards first because they're supposed to move. Mm hmm. Oops. Yeah, that's the correct phrasing. No, that was the correct facing. Sorry, these guys, these models swivel on their hips, so it's hard to tell sometimes if they're faced correctly, but that's correct. They're supposed that to make that... look right. Because I scored when this guy was... There we go. Yeah. I was just saying, hang on a minute, because I scored when this guy did that. Mm -hmm. So my character's going to move forward to score. Your character moved to there. Cool. Um, no, he doesn't move to there. Mm -hmm. Um... He's going to move there. That's the past. Now the present moves out. You move first. Cool. Uh, so this, actually, this guy would move into my square. So yeah. What happens there? Yeah, yeah. Um, that has never happened before. Um, I walk into you and go, "Oof!" This is in in the more. This is normally where um, an instance of of you know either combat. This is where the role playing comes in. Where you know what happens is we we bump into each other and we have to decide what happens. Do you do the whole two thieves working together? Um, um, for this basic prototype, I was going to say, you know what, we'll just call it my move has been interrupted and you changed the past. Or we could throw in some of the advanced stuff and decide what to do. We could fight, we could do, you know, be thieves who work together and just sort of try and stay quiet as we fuck up, excuse me, mess up and bump into each other. What do you want to do? I walk into you, and then we go from there. Okay, well, you're going to, uh, I think it's some kind of thing to roll, because my character is going to want to leap for the treasure. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're going to try and... So that's my call. Yeah. So if you're going to try and bum rush him to prevent that, then... I'm going to keep it friendly to keep the game going. We could start fighting, but I, I you know, whenever... In my experience with... with um, we're fighting other players as a possibility and people start fighting. The rest of the game involves lots of fighting. I want to keep it friendly to see just what happens with populating the board. So, I respectfully don't stop you from grabbing the treasure I was clearly going for. So... That means, oh, hold on. Well, because you're going to move first. So. I didn't move this guy, who, because you, yeah, well, before she moved, because this guy dropped in, and now he's in the present. Yeah, he's in the present, but I was just kind of acting out the past, just going to, that's how the past would play out. Mm. So that guy's going to move his one. This guy's going to get stopped. You now in the present get to move forward one. And collect cool. it, and that stops everything. Cool. That stops the current playthrough, but everything that happened in the past still happens. So you still score this guy, as we don't need to. Um, yeah, and that's already going to be counted. So you scored two in the literal history of all this. Um, and I score one. My first. Cool. So... Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Ouch. Super cool. No, oh, that doesn't. I'm just, I yeah, just, you're like, right. No, it's psychologically easier, yeah. And that being said, okay, so. And uh, you did win the round, so you get to place, what, one piece? Yeah. Uh, I did indeed. I don't, I don't get to place anything, correct? You get to play. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so I still score two points because that's what would have happened in the past. Exactly. But um, which puts me at wait, well, uh, actually it puts me at five. So cool. Uh, but and you have one, so I'll keep track of your score here. 
Cool. Five. Well, yeah, I scored one the first turn, two the second turn, and two again the third turn. Cool. That is not five. That is three. See what I mean? No. Gotcha. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> You're not gaining for each one that you gain, because everything's happening at the same time. So it's however many times you grabbed one of the collectibles. So you scored one the first time, mm -hmm. and then another one with this model, and then another one there. He didn't grab it. Aha. Uh -huh. So how many times you, did you place a model on one of the dice? Just once. Well, actually twice. I, have, well, I, have pla I placed the model here once mm -hmm. on the first turn. Second turn, I placed the model here. Actually, third turn, I put, placed the model there before you took yours. So three. Gotcha. Uh, but this guy just got placed. He did not actually get. Okay. I did not have my turn yet, so you were. So you took your die first. Right, right. Cool. Which, if you think about it, basically at this point forward, if. Uh, actually, no. It basically means that, uh, if you continue to take one die per turn, I'm still going to be a point ahead of you for the rest of the game. So. Interesting. I mean, because it, it, it depends on where you place the, the next piece, but I will say that, I mean, just because this is my strat my strategy hit was go and is going to be essentially put them within one inch and let everybody just kind of run in and just kind of grab. If you put your stuff further in, well, they're not just, they're just not going to get taken or they're going to be, you're going to jump in and take them. Mm -hmm. But eventually... When you say jump in and take them, what do you mean? Just one square away and next turn you jump in and take one and that's going to basically be what goes on from, but because i am still one point ahead for the moment it pretty much looks like i'm going to be scoring one actually because you go first if you if you do that strategy you're eventually going to pull forward mm -hmm. so regardless of how it turns out at this point you're going to win this is the kind of confusion and chaos that you can dissect and then f sort of, you know, I, I want to take something really procedural like, like a game and then, you know, do something really unexpected with it. So this is actually the kind of thing, the result that I wanted, um, you know, because I wasn't doing that on purpose. But nonetheless, it turns out that I will inevitably win, yeah. um, at Which, least in this basic version of the rules. What, you, what I think should work better, yes. instead of having it where you can come in from everywhere, I think designated entry points would would limit the options of how you come in and also maybe you want to not just script getting to the treasure but getting out with it so both of those things are part of more advanced versions yeah. of other prototype I, I, because, but yeah i mean because this the simple version i mean i can very cl clearly see what's going to happen because i at this point i see how i'm going to score but i also see that if he does adapt the same strategy that i had implemented to begin with Essentially, we're all going to, um, it's all going to boil down to who goes first. And because that, does, that never changes, it's always the same person first. Um, unless we've, the only way the simple version of this really could be competitive is if there is perhaps a roll off or some way of determining who goes first every round. Because if it stays the same, then basically whoever goes first. Then it's has fixed. the advantage and usually is going to win just mm -hmm. because you can always place yourself within a square or two of the objective and claim it first. And yeah, later as the game gets more cluttered, it means more stuff's going to happen, but it also means that um, unless there's like a last second round where someone basically just makes a move where it's like, okay, the only if you you're going to move first and then your only move is to do this and that's going to literally cancel out all your other moves and therefore I gain all the treasure because you guys are all spasming out. So basically if the score basically isn't tallied until the actual end that might be a little bit more of a thing because then it's a it's a little chess match it's a literal chess match of not just it's kind of like go where you're basically placing your pieces and the idea is controlling the field so it's not just where you place your treasures and where you place your guys but it's also a question of okay 
I need to limit movement here, you know, the turn length and so on and so forth, knowing all of that and knowing, you know, what strategies would happen. It's a lot like Go. Um, so for the basic version of the game, you need to change the win conditions other than just, you know, yeah. co collect until you basically someone spazzes out because basically mm -hmm. if, if that's the case, then your whoever goes first is going to win no matter how, because you started at a deficit, but yeah, as the game goes on and you start adapt the start, a strategy that I basically forced you into mm -hmm. by limiting the turn numbers, that's going to happen constantly. So it's basically like, okay, well, from here, you know, from here on out, your score can only surpass mine. Right. So. Okay. Well, that was really productive. You know, I, yeah, thank you for all the feedback. Um, I definitely feel like the basic version is, is insubstantial. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's not complete because I hit all the objectives that I had for it, but at the same time, it's not, um, it doesn't sound like it's making for a satisfying game. Um, would you say that you had fun? Yeah, I mean, because I can see the potential in this game. Good. I mean, again, it, it's uh, it's an interesting concept. I really do want to see where you go with this, but mm -hmm. I, I really do think that it's like, well, having this open a, a field and just being able to literally spawn in wherever mm -hmm. is a little bit of a, it's like, well, I, I grant you that your time, it's a time machine. You could literally show up everywhere where you by basically just going, Okay, I need to be here in this time, so I turn, you know, I show up, you know, three days early or four days in the past or whatever it is. However long you need to be to in that spot, and then you just turn the dial and show up right where you need to be, and you're basically there. Mm -hmm. Mechanically, I understand that that's a thing, and that's, but, um, yeah, I'm serious. The narratively, you can't necessarily at that point justify. Mm -hmm. um, But I do think getting out has to be a thing. Where you gotcha. Got, oh, yeah. Where, you, where it may, maybe, yeah, you teleport in. Actually, yeah, even no, because if you still have the... T the uh, you have to put your hand up a little higher. There you go. But, yeah, because even getting out th is, is a simple thing. Because if, if it is just something as simple as being able to turn a dial on your belt, mm -hmm. you just grab the thing and just go, <laughs> and you're gone. I love that you went to the narrative structure of this because I I love that. I, I really don't appreciate people saying that, you know, storytelling is is, you know, not part of every game. It totally is. Even when you don't have a narrative based game, you create a narrative with the gameplay that you experience. So I love that you went to that as quickly as you did, especially being such a, a role player and a storyteller as, as you are. Um, you know, absolutely, you know, one of the biggest reasons why I wanted you on this project. Um, not just this game and Paradise in general, but especially this game. Um, and how you went to, you know, well, what if you have like a dial on your belt that you started rationalizing what it was? I actually did write it and um, it was it was just going to be a ring. Like it was going to be something as, as basic as that. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, no, I hear you. So... Uh... I think basically what we should basically say is that your your entry is free because you're again you have all the, you literally have all the time in the world to prep. Yeah. So getting in is easy. So mm -hmm. You can show up. Getting out is going to be difficult because I can't imagine that jumping through time is a energy easy process. And therefore, when you jump in, you must spend a certain number of turns either waiting to get out. Excellent. So, so either you have to find your way to an exit within a s certain number of turns. Let's say six is an arbitrary starting sure. number. So, it also gives your the other things. It also ex basically the way things are going. I artificially stop, shorten the length of time by not knowing at first how long you know the start was. So, yeah, we ran in and suddenly things were happening and you know. The, the turn length went from here would have been six turns or whatever it was till one and or to two and then one. So if um, if you basically say okay, there has to be a minimum turn li limit, and you create that by saying, look, you have to either survive for let's for the 
Let's actually make it 10 turns. Just Sure. Round number. Yeah, round number. Let's say 10 turns. You have to survive on this map for 10 turns before you can literally just pop out of existence and you are no longer on the board. You just you grab your item and then uh, the uh, you, you grab your treasure and then you're running with it. Uh, and that might actually change the AI of how the the guards react because they're like mm -hmm. they're gonna notice on one exactly. of the passes, and they're going to start looking around and maybe they'll start moving faster. They get a mo like they get a move bonus mm -hmm. to try, but their their direction is determined randomly. So you'll roll it, let's say a D four or a D eight to determine which direction they move, and they and we still follow the same rules for their vision path, but their movement is from that point forward, basically random, but it becomes scripted because you record which way they go, and then it's like, okay, once you've done this, then they're going to do this. We know mm -hmm. how it goes, but we know... It adds an element of randomness that the players cannot adjust for. Excellent. And it also... or Well, it can, at least initially can't adjust for, but it can then eventually plan for and become part of their strategy. Mm -hmm. But it also by increasing the turn length and basically saying you either have to get to an exit for the turn for this round to end for whatever your turn round whatever for this mm -hmm. thing then you either have to get to an exit or survive for 10 iterations that's awesome before your ring or your belt whatever yeah. it is recharges enough for you to re immediately blink out yeah that's awesome. So that's really encouraging for me to hear because a, it's great feedback. Thank you. Um, really, that's that's awesome. That's that's the level of analysis I knew that you'd bring. So thank you, John. Um, the other reasons why it's really encouraging for me to hear is that a lot of what you're talking about, and I I can't quite tell, um, just because we're talking about so much. Normally, I'd be taking notes like crazy, but that's that's one of the you know we're gonna have the videos archived, um, and th this is the note taking. Um, is that a lot of from what I'm hearing? Almost everything you're saying, at least in a general sense, um, is stuff that I'd already already built into, you know, other prototypes. You know, the idea of there being this is a stealth game. It's about being methodical and all that. But, you know, stuff happens and then it becomes a race and you have to go back. One of one of the first ideas I had was, you know, this is this is too chaotic and not rewarding enough. Um, what if, you know, you hit, you know, you start you basically hit start on the time machine and you have X amount of time and you have to go back to the time machine in order to not die. So you have to race in, grab it, and then race out. You know, that's absolutely something. Guards reacting and they, you know, that's part of the AI. You know, none of this, they walk in a tight circle. You know, I mean what I said where, you know, having the start level, or in this case, not the start level, but the start instance of a game being really boring is actually really powerful and really potential um that's not at all this the guards just walk in a circle around the collectible that's not at all something that's going to make it to the next version let alone the final version of this game you know guards are going to react and you know and how do how do you what's the what's the in-game metaphor for creating sound and stuff like that um you know that's absolutely part of it um but i loved what you what you added and i didn't think of it at all where the guards react randomly. You know, I had lots of stuff where you make a noise and the guards turn around and run to that. You know, actually actually making the pen and paper AI intelligent in that way was my first thought. Um, I really love the guards reacting randomly, so you can't prepare for it. That's until, you know, you get to see it happen and, you know, as it existed in the past and you get to prepare for it then. Uh, that's brilliant. I love that. Um, yeah, but, uh, yeah. The, the idea came to me because um, in D&D, there's a spell called Darkness. For those of you who have played D and D and had had to deal with this particular thing, you kind of know where this is going. But uh, see, the thing of it is, is that when you're in darkness, it's magical darkness, so you literally cannot see. It is literally pitch black unless you are of a very, very particular set of skills that allows you to do so. So you're Liam Neeson, okay? Uh, yeah, unless you are Liam Neeson. You are not going to see through this. So you're literally going to stumble. And enemies usually don't have that particular set of skills either. So they're stumbling in the dark. And what happens in that case is usually they walk in a random direction because you don't know which way you're going. Gotcha. You're, you're snow blind. Yeah, you end up going in a circle. Okay. Yeah, where you Because the darkness is so complete that you literally cannot see your hand in front of your face. You, yeah. you could touch yourself and it would be a surreal experience because your vision is pitch black mm -hmm. so it is that kind of thing now you could basically plan to try and walk straight and 
if you plan to do that, you can make a roll to see how straight you walk. Because most people, and, and if you doubt this, there's a Mythbusters episode for it you can watch. But yeah, most people Excellent. tend to stray one way or another after a certain distance, especially with they, when they have no point of reference to walk forward with. So what will happen is that people will walk through not knowing if they're bumping into friend or foe. And now, again, this doesn't necessarily detract sound. Mm -hmm. So you can right. hear people shuffling around. So you're trying to go... Yeah. Uh, and, That's a uh, huge uh, uh, part uh, of the advanced part of this is I know there's someone behind me. I can't turn around. Yeah, you, Hold on. But, what, what if they're not me? Yeah. yeah. So, you, so you know... It's like, okay, there's someone behind... You know that there are people around you, but you don't know friend or foe, unless you're really paying attention. You don't know anything. So you're basically stumbling around in the dark until the spell ends, or until you randomly bump into something that you happen to know is an enemy. And then you can try and swing at it, and it's not a fun thing. <laughs> but the way that we deal, or that I usually deal with darkness, in, when you're stumbling around and have no idea or no direction which, which you're going, you have no idea which way you're facing, which way you get out, you roll a d8, and basically each number represents a cardinal direction. So it starts to use this figuring mm -hmm. here. I'm going to move this out of your way so you can see. So to use this figuring here, this would be 1, and then 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. On a d8, I roll the d8, figure out which way the guy goes, and that's the way he heads. So I roll I roll a 6, so that's this way. He, he goes this way. If it he then rolls again. I start from. I, I can either choose to start from uh, the same direction, or I can choose to roll from the direction he's facing. And this is the new one. That's probably the way I really should do it. But uh, it depends on how you want to go about it, just to keep things straight, so you don't have to keep going. Okay, which way? Usually, I just go. Okay, which one? Which way is he going? Randomly determined, and the num the direction, the orientation of the grid doesn't change. So. D8, okay, he moves this way. Next D8, which way does he go? And when you finally clear the darkness is when you can finally move under your control again. It was a really... Uh, 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 it's a really helpful and not helpful tr uh, tip because it basically means everyone's stumbling around in the dark and has no idea what the heck's happening. Um, I like it. The good news is, or I actually did build a character who took advantage of the fact that he actually could see through the darkness. That's cool. Because we were ambushed by a bunch of people, and my character was like, oh, crap. So... Wait, you built him from scratch to be able to do that? And it was a coincidence, or you modified your character? No, the character... Uh, the warlocks get an ability called Devil's Sight. Hmm, cool. So, um, at, at uh, third, third, second or third level, they get elder, Eldritch Invocations, you choose two. And you get more as you level up. But uh, Devil's Sight is one of the invocations you can choose. And basically what it says is that you can see through magically, through darkness, even magically created darkness. And it increases your, your, the range of your dark vision. So you basically see like, you, the way you're, you see it's basically like a flare, all infrared, where it's basically cool. just black and white and shades of gray. And that's what you see as you're looking through this magically, through any form of darkness, magically created or otherwise. But uh, because my character could see, but nothing else in the battlefield could, everyone else was literally just swinging madly around, and I was just basically blasting at people that I That's could clearly cool. see and had no, that they had no fun. clue uh, where it was. And the only thing I had to worry about was keeping my distance so that they couldn't actually charge me, and I actually failed to do that on a few occasions. Uh, I also didn't count on uh, the fact that, that the sorcerer of the enemy group would get clear and then just decide, you know what, strew my own guys and throw a fireball in the middle of the darkness. <laughs> So uh, literally just nuked everybody, including me, because I had run into the darkness to get cover from people who had actually escaped and they were like running around. Mm -hmm. This guy got loose and then suddenly he's like, nah, -uh. <laughs> I am the only one I can see outside. Screw it and screw everyone, you know, in, in that bubble. He threw a fireball and suddenly I lost. And because uh, the darkness is a concentration spell, um, 
it, I lost concentration on the spell. The darkness went away, and suddenly we found ourselves very, very much surrounded. Mm. So I had to very quickly go ahead and cast it again. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no. Uh, I can do this all day. You can only do that once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's awesome. Well, thank you for the feedback, John. This is great. This is exactly what I wanted. One of the many things I wanted to do with the show. Um, so, yeah. For anybody out there watching, if you have a game that you would like us to test, I know how it feels to not have a lot of people to test with. Like, John, John's great, and my, my core group of gamers are great. My core group of uh, fellow game developers are great, but that's not a huge amount of people. This is, this is the venue for doing testing on the internet um, for, for tabletop games. Um, so you are, you are not limited to just finding new game stores and, you know, you know asking people to play for you, p play with you to test your games. If you, anybody out there wants to have your game tested, you can send a list of materials to us or you, and I can prototype them, uh, prototype the materials to make the, to prototype the game. Or um, you can send us prototypes if you're, if you're so confident. Um, we're not about to give out our, our physical address, but at the same time, you can let us know. Uh, hit us up on Twitch and on Discord. Um, yeah, we'll be on every Wednesdays. We've been having trouble pinning down an exact time, but that's because of all the new and exciting technology we have and, you know, the space, the, our building constantly changing. But we'll definitely be here on, on, on Wednesdays. Um, so, yeah, thank you for everything. John, is there anything more you wanted to... Uh, I think eventually... What, what I will say is that for those of you who want to actually send in a physical pr prototype... Um, Eventually, when the stream actually picks up a little bit more, we're able to actually, yeah, exactly. We're uh, this, this, this dun dun dun, yeah. Garyan, hey Garyan, yeah, we yeah, were. Eventually, the, a PO box yep. will be something that will be on the list. Of yeah, things that we will get as soon as we can establish ourselves properly and uh, actually have enough to make sure that we can keep the lights on and afford the PO box. But uh, I've been here, yeah, Garyan, hey, amen. Uh, but yeah, um, once we, uh, that'll be a thing probably for future. For, Thing. Until then, uh, just a similar locker room we can probably come up with. So you can just send us the details, yeah. and we'll we'll, um, we'll, yeah. we'll come up with as close to similar locker room as we can make. Definitely, um, we don't um, mind unless it is something where it's like it's where you can uh, you can really convince one of these guys to actually go out and, and meet you somewhere to to collect the materials and. Yeah, you know, in a, in a public venue with lots of witnesses around. Yeah, um, <laughs> no, that's 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 exactly where my line of thinking wound up as well. Um, but it's yeah, not that we don't trust you. It's just that we don't trust you. <laughs> it's not that we don't trust you. It's that we don't trust anybody. No, it's that um, um, we'll get the ball rolling. Um, I don't have my boss handy to to ask if it's cool if we give like the region that we're in. Um, but you know, um, drop us a line on Discord and we're, Twitch, and we can go from there. See, we're. I'll give you a hint. We're on Earth. Uh, we we're, are. We're we're we're, on we're Earth in an English speaking place, uh, which doesn't mean anything because English is the international trade language. So, you know, try and figure that one out. But yeah, we're we're on Earth in the Soul System. Uh, yes, which is is uh, it actually pronounced Soul? I always thought that people were were just like that was a science fiction trope, and people were copying it. Is it actually Soul and Solar, and they're interchangeable? Uh, it's, well, technically, it is the because we use the Latin and it's Soul. Interesting. S O L. Yeah. So it, it is the it is technically it, it, because any uh, any system that that is around a star is called a solar system. Right. Because that is the literal That's what that word means, yeah. Uh, so ours is not the solar system. Our, if you were to literally name our system, it is the soul system. Yeah. Um, so we are in the soul system. I got in, soul, baby. Which is on the... Um, where I used to have this memorized down to a T. So we're in the uh, soul system in the... Uh, John studied uh, not astrophysics. Um, actually, yes, I did study astrophysics. Oh, was that part of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's I, cool. I studied astronomy and physics, so technically that's astrophysics. It is astrophysics, and yeah, it's part of a part of learning astronomy oh. is in fact astrophysics. Astrophysics, yeah. You learn the, how to calculate the motion of stellar oh, yeah. objects. Oh yeah. John was an aerospace guy for a while. For a long while, but for a long I, excuse me. For a long while, and then I realized I one day I woke up I was like I don't really want to do this, and I am glad I didn't because it was right before the industry tank. So. I got out, and now I'm. And then the problem is, is that many years later, I find out that Elon Musk is the thing. I was like, "Well, shit." <laughs> Pardon my language. <laughs> so, um, but anyways, moving right along. Yeah. Uh, 
So, so yes, yeah, tabletop we, games. <laughs> yes, tabletop games. Yes, we are located on Earth in yeah. the Sol system, which is uh, in the Andromeda subsystem, which is on the Orion Spur of the Milky Way Galaxy, which is in the uh, the uh, and. And uh, the local, cl well, we call it the local cluster. That is, unfortunately, the only name we have for it, but it's the local cluster of the uh, Sagittarius. Uh, That's the name for a game store. The local cluster. That's actually a pretty good yeah. uh, And uh, Thank you. And uh, we're, we're part of the Sagittari Sagittarius uh, cluster of galaxies, which is a part of the Alania Kea supercluster. Nice. Which is in the Virgo wall basically yeah. it's it, there i used to be able to recite this really quickly but i haven't done it had to do it in a while and also because the last few people i had i've done this to uh nearly slapped me and i i pretty much deserved that one <laughs> uh, but yes uh the uh we uh, very 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 specific without being any more helpful that's how you yeah. you're an engineer <laughs> But in all seriousness, if you want to um, take advantage of of us playing your games or us showing your games, you know, maybe you have a final game and you just want us to play it um, with with Min Potions community, um, get in touch with us at the usual places: Discord, Twitch. Um, I know Jake's on Twitter, but you know we have a Facebook and all that good stuff. All the ways that you can reach us: Discord and Twitch are the best. Um, but yeah, John, if you have any closing thoughts about the game, um, I'd love to hear them. Mm. I think uh, we should we should invest in actual proper figures and not. Yep. Um, uh, and we don't even have to actually go for like the super expensive ones, like these no. space marines that we're using. No, no, no. Uh, no. These are just on my desk in a box, and I just. But um, yeah. no, we, D and D like, figures are affordable. Well, yeah, but uh, I was actually thinking more along the lines of actually just buying a thing of army men. Cool. Yeah. I have one. I mean, you just a. a you can buy a decently stocked uh, thing of army men or similar plastic miniatures for less than ten dollars at your local games as your local uh, Walmart or Target, really. And um, yeah, and you can use them to as figurines. I use them in my D and D games because yeah. they are cheap. And uh, when you're doing tabletop prototyping, every developer has army men. Like it's it's it is. It's it's the stage it's, one. It's yeah, absolutely. And they're so versatile. I mean, most people, I mean, really, uh, really kind of poo poo all over, all over the uh, the fact that people still play with army men. But actually, nerds complaining about things. Nerds complaining about everything. What are you talking about? Who are you kidding here? Sarcasm. <laughs> what? <laughs> Anyways, but, but yeah, so. Uh, if you ever are in a situation where you want to play games or if you have uh, uh, something, you don't necessarily have to go for the official figures. No. Go for yeah, the Yeah, these guys are expensive. Stuff. Yeah. I mean, I have I bought these figures for my D&D campaign. These are made by a company called... Yeah, Man I'm Room. just going to put them up in the big... I'm not, uh, not going to tell you what company they're made from. I will say that they are just basically unpainted plastic figurines. They are these, these are primed, right? No, Cause, they're not. Okay, because uh, D&D's new minis um, come primed. The D and D's minis actually come painted, fully painted. Really? Then how can I see? I just see a bunch of them at my uh, the local store. There are you can get. There are several different kinds you can get. The official ones that that are available for release are all painted. They cost about ten dollars for a set of five. Cool. Um, the and they're usually uh, ready ready sorted. So basically, you know what you're getting in the package. Uh, they are. They have the unpainted primed version, which you can get for slightly cheaper. I think it's five dollars for a set of five. Actually, no, I think it's more than that. I think the the, the painted versions I think are fifteen. The unpainted primed versions are ten for the official models. And these I paid a dollar a dollar thirty for. Cool. So and these are unpainted, unprimed. It's just simple plastic. And you bought them new, right? Bought them new. Uh, uh, and uh, the the sculpture that it has no base really to speak of. It, it, oh, mean, but that's easy. You can glue that to anything. You can glue it to anything, but yeah, this thing is sturdy enough; it'll stand on its own. Mm. And it's and they're they're real light, so you don't have to worry about them tipping over. Um, 
they have they come in all different shapes, sizes, different braces, different configurations and such. Cool. Uh, there are hundreds of them. Yeah. And they but are dirt cheap, and you can pay totally. yourself if you want to. And if you don't feel like buying anything, you know, we'd be happy to improvise whatever whatever your game yeah, might need. I've seen I've seen players use dice. Yeah. No. Definitely. Yeah, we use dice for the collectibles. You know. I I mean I personally prefer to use a figurine because one, it's easier, and also because occasionally uh, you people need DM uses. Uh, dice for the enemies and it's easy to get them confused. Interesting. So, let's not... Cool. Uh, yeah. yeah um, anything you can do to ease the amount of confusion on a table is worth spending time and effort for. Exactly. Um, um, anything um, gameplay-wise um, gameplay before wise, we go? No, nothing beyond the criticisms I've already stated, which is basically awesome. we just need... Basically, it's, uh, if someone artificially shortens a turn, you have to have a way of artificially lengthening the turn as well. Definitely. So there has to be at least a... A beginning turn length there and ways to shorten it by either getting out through mm -hmm. an exit I mean that could be part of the game where you yeah. literally prepare that's an exit. that's exactly what I was thinking I mean like where you it's like okay you know there's a door it's a you get to it you find that's alarmed well okay this turn you set up the you know it's basically you teleport in Un or disable the alarm on the door and then run away. And you know you actually exit with that character. Mm -hmm. Every other turn beyond that, that is your exit point. Your cho your basic goal is to run out that door. Um, and to do so without letting yourself be seen by yourself. Or at least, you know, seen face to face. Mm -hmm. Uh you could, or you could basically just try to find some kind of bolt hole where you can survive for a certain number of turns until your power recharges. Excellent. Again, knowing temporal mechanics as I do, because I've researched this kind of stuff, um, as we do, a as we all do, it's a amount of power. Yeah. I mean, literally, you need a black hole in order to do something any remote. In the, that's the kind of power we're talking about. But the thing about it is, is that we actually can make micro-sized black holes which produce n ludicrous amounts of power. It just takes a lot of equipment to make them. It's called the Kugel Blitz. It's made from light. You can actually make them. They actually work. The downside is they decay rather quickly. They do shoot an obscene amount of radiation, but if you're actually using them to power the thing, even so, uh, it's going to take a little bit of while. Uh, yes, what if competitive go up? Yeah, that could work too. Again, the the, the, sort, yeah, of, the definitely. sort of narrative that he's got going right now is oh, like yeah. you are competitive co-op with yourself. Right. You with yourself and you can play cooperatively or competitively, you know, um with each other as is, you know. And that that wasn't part, you know, the, you know, combat system and you know having the guards, the uh, AI being something that's more intelligent was not part of this prototype, but it's definitely going to it, it's definitely part of prototypes I already have for this game where, you know, at any point he and I could be messing with each other and then decide to work cooperatively instead of competitively, but then what about what we've already done in the past and we have to deal with that and all the mistakes and decisions we've made we have to live with um but yeah no um thank you for the feedback gary and um that's totally totally something um that's already in the works yeah uh and so again besides just uh finding a way of uh, basically making sure that the game actually has a certain turn length mm -hmm. uh whether or not you start in a certain times and you have 12 turns or you choose to get in closer and you still have to survive 10 whatever the number is you have to or you don't again. You're not. You don't have to be married to this, a, a fixed number. You can oh. choose seven as your turn number, sure. and and be a disciple of Nurgle. I mean, <laughs> but um, the the point is, is that you have to have. The, in order for this to really start to get really complex, and for people to really have to think about their movements, and planning, and all the other things, you have to give them a reason to stay on the board. Mm -hmm. If the turn ends as soon as you grab the loot, there is no reason to do anything other than just stack this treasure right next to everything and just run in, grab, and go. Mm -hmm. In which case, again, like I said before, it doesn't matter who has uh, that turn. Basically, all the turns are whoever goes first goes first because after... After the inner line gets filled, and the next inner line gets filled, and the next inner line gets filled, and if you have a coordinated set of turns, basically all it will be is just people running in, grabbing a treasure, and ending the turn, and then whoever goes first wins because they 
get the advantage of being able to teleport next to the thing and grab it. Right. On. Right, right, right. Yeah, um, no, that definitely that definitely tests well, and I don't mean it turned out well. I mean it was a good test to yeah. see, um, you know, just how far this is boring. I'm going to make it more interesting. Goes, which is, and I didn't expect this to go very far, but it really doesn't go very far because you're exactly right. Just eventually, people go, okay, I get it, and then they line up treasure. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, as soon as I figured out, oh, it's limited turn numbers, and you can grab them. Why would I put anything in the middle? I'm going to put it right next to the edge where I can just grab it and go. Mm-hmm. And then when I start to realize, oh, well, if I do that, then that means that the guy who goes first, which is him, means he gets to grab the treasures first because he moves first on every turn. There you go. He wins. Sad for me, but that's part of the game test. Mm-hmm. And that is how it works. Definitely. So, uh, again, I would basically just, as long as you can, if you can make sure that people stay on the map for a certain number of turns, even if that number gets reduced to only a handful of turns because they set up by or through clever gameplay, they basically managed to make their exit and basically set up a bolt for everybody to run through. And it's just, hey, everyone can exit through the same thing. Then later turns become about timing. So you you because well, well you know yeah everyone has to head to that entra- exit but um no I think we're we're about yeah. to wrap this up so yeah we're, we're, okay I think, cool I think ten more minutes and we're out of here so cool but yeah so again once I, I mean players can create multiple exits it's going to change the direction of the guards it's going to do a lot of other things. I mean, I'm sure, and I'm sure the guards are going to notice. Hey, some of this stuff wasn't here before, so the guards can actually collect t- treasures, and we'll we'll have scripts written for what what the guards do when they encounter something that shouldn't be where it is, mm-hmm. and you know how they react to other things. So the, the game can be relatively made complex by just coming up with some very basic rules, uh, which just become complex just be- yeah, through simplicity definitely and but the the main thing is we have to make sure the game actually plays because um if it's just you know tic tac toe mm-hmm. you know once you get you know someone else's rhythm tic tac toe either becomes a deadlock or you win every time mm-hmm. that's simple um the you know especially if you, especially if you're going first, it is pretty easy to win and take tack down, and that's essentially what this game will turn into on the simplest level that we tested it at. Right. It's not a negative against the game, but just saying. No, no. Okay. This no, no. Is, All feedback is welcome. The, All yeah. feedback is useful. Yeah. With, with the, the way it was set up here, yeah. Essentially, this is going to this because this became take tack down very quickly mm-hmm. because the turn limits got reduced to basically zero, very fast. If you continue the turn, however, and so again, it's not just about, well, I grabbed the treasure. It's, I grabbed the treasure. Now I have to get out with it. Yeah. That changes the game. Totally. Because it just says, oh, okay. So now it's not just, I have to go. Because it, was, it could be just like, oh, hey, you know, as, if you, as soon as the, a player grabs one treasure and a guard notices, it might not just be the one guard who reacts. He might be able to notify the, all the other guards in the field and say, "We've got an intruder," and then suddenly all guard movement becomes random for a few number of turns until you guys can determine their script. Yeah, excellent. So, yeah, you, there is a lot to, that can change, a lot that can work. But beyond that, I mean. It sounds like you already have a handle on this. You mm-hmm. already know what's going on. Yeah, no, that's the next so thing I was going to say is, you know. We will, we will test, play test more advanced versions of course. the game in the future. Yeah. But as a starter, again, you sure. very quickly devolve into the tattoo. We need to find, if we want to continue to play this, the simplified game, we need to in, include something like a turn. Yeah, I don't think number. I want to return to this simplified version. You know, I wanted to, I didn't know, how because I've been, you know, just idly thinking about this as my you know my my most immediate project for a while and i wasn't sure how comfortable i'd gotten with the complexity so i wanted to try sorry uh try try the most basic version that i could think of um with someone who never played it before i really don't have any desire to return to this most simple version um so we talked about a lot of different stuff so to review um make turn length 
limited and make it matter in the form of getting in and having to get out, you know, and that definitely returns to, um, you know, what I was talking about in the beginning of this episode with, you know, having that element of a race, you know, have, having to move quickly in this, in, you know, within a stealth game. Um, uh, that's absolutely something I already thought of. It's in the works, another prototype. Um, having guards react and having there be an artificial intelligence there, not um, not just go in a circle is absolutely, is something that you brought up um, and returned to. Um, and I absolutely have in the works as well. Um a lot of the stuff, uh, a lot of the details um, that you talked about, I definitely have in the works. But having the guards react randomly, like an alarm go off, like that's brilliant. Like that's not something exactly as you said the players can account for because they're going to react randomly. So off the top of my head, that screams stuff like roll a die to see how far they move, roll a die to see what direction they move, and stuff like that. So that's that's not only brilliant, it's easy to implement. Yeah. Um, All you would have to do is, is include one D8 with the game. Yeah. That's, I mean, when you when you finally Ooh. get to the box form. Yeah, I mean, you're you have basically the guards in one color, so we'll make them gray. Mm-hmm. You have team red versus team blue, mm-hmm. or team teal versus team sure. blue. whatever. You have two, two different colors for 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 each individual team, and then uh, you include at least a D eight so that you can determine uh, and deter- and probably a couple of. Uh, probably a couple of strips with uh, counters on them so that you can count down your turns. Mm-hmm. So it's not it's not just, you know, it starts uh, like right at turn one. No, it starts, that timer starts as soon as you place your model in. So once you put your model gotcha. in, then you put your, your, your first counter on the six, two, one, and then, you know, counts down mm-hmm. until you get to zero. And then at zero, you either automatically pock out yep. or something happens. Suitably bad you. happens to you, yeah. So either you have to escape before the timer runs out or the timer running out is your end goal so that you basically, mm-hmm. that's when you recharge and you're able to use your time. Yeah. Uh, that's almost exactly what I was thinking of originally, which is just you have to get back to the lab where the time machine is. you know. And you know another specific thing that you'd said, which is having specific entry and exit points, was also something that... Um, um, you know what you could do? Yes. To me? Um, have your entry if you're if you're gonna play the um, the sort of time rift thing. Have the uh, the entryway be an exit portal as well. So if you're on a certain square when a timer runs out on that square, it's an escape route because basically you don't have the time machine on you. It becomes something that you have it set up someplace. And basically, you just say, okay, at this time, this thing teleports me to this place, and then at that, at, you know, a few seconds later, or when the machine recharges a few days, centuries, whatever later it takes mm-hmm. to charge up again, it will pull you from target B, or from the next place to the next place, and you get to do it again. So, spatially, temporally, it basically, it's like, okay, I show up here. This is where I poured in. I have six turns to get whatever thing mm-hmm. and then get back to this spot to be teleported back out. Yeah, I don't think even teleporting is going to be that big of a thing. Yeah, but you could also just teleport in, run in, and find some other way out. And then on later turns, when this gets to that zero mark, it's like, okay, I came in over here, but I'm going to grab something here and then run to here. And when that timer runs out, I'm out. Nice. And that's how you basically, you, it's another it's another way of adding an extra escape way. Nice. So it's a, and it gives you something to race towards because mm-hmm. what happens if you race toward it, something happens and you miss it. Mm-hmm. Or your opponent gets to it first. Right. You know, if your opponent's standing there and just chooses to wait. Yeah. <laughs> And it's like hi. Exactly. Yeah, that's 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 one of the reasons why I went towards um, having you know a specific door or window, you know, a specific entry exit point. Um, you could come in and block them, you know, once you know because they've done it in the past um, where they're going to come in and come out. You could just have your guy standing right in front of the door, ready to block them. And then we'll have to find, and then we'll have rules for what happens when that happens because mm-hmm. obviously it didn't happen in the past. Does that cause a paradox right then and there? Mm-hmm. So, 
Yeah. Again, it's a lot of food for thought. There's a lot of definitely a lot of potential in this game, but then again, uh, we can also see the obvious sort of pitfalls of leaving not enough rules. So, mm-hmm. so uh, again, um, leaving not enough rules for this version or for future versions. For for this version. Gotcha. So oh yeah. For yeah, the, yeah. This yeah. version did not have enough rules. Definitely. Paradox. Oh yeah. Docks. Yeah. That's <laughs> sure. Thank you, Garion. Oh, that's uh, yeah. It's yeah. Name now. Paradox. We, we, I mean, the game was originally called Deja Vu, but no, I think Paradox means oh, is, is a, oh. could work. I think I'm very attached to the name Deja Vu, but at the same time, that sounds pretty good. I think that's going to be this show's first in-joke, though. Fair enough. I like it. So, yeah, that's kind of what we have to say about the matter, I think. Uh, so, yeah. uh, ready to wrap up? I am, unless... Yeah, no, thank you so much, John, for playtesting with me. I'm sorry that uh, all the technical stuff going on ca- made it take this long to get to it, but this kind of development of tabletop games... Um, and we're absolutely going to keep playing games for fun and just, you know, doing tabletop news and, you know, playing a lot of 40K, but absolutely. Um, thank you, Garyan. Absolutely. Thank you, Garyan. Thank you... Um, I almost said two-cart. I do love two-cart, but no, thank you, Dogan for stopping by as well. Um, But without further ado, we will see you all next Wednesday. Thanks, everyone.